going to confirm the webcast is now live. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can I welcome you all to the Planning and Regulatory Committee of Friday, the 27th of November, 10.30. Please note that this is a remote meeting operating under the standing orders of the Surrey County Council, Constitution and the new regulations, brackets, local authorities and police and crime panels, brackets, coronavirus, brackets, flexibility of local authority and police and crime panel meetings, England and Wales, regulation 2020, created by the Coronavirus Act 2020. As much as possible, this meeting will run as it was taking place in the council building with the same standards expected in terms of behaviour. We are able to meet microphones if there is disruption and ultimately remove participants from the meeting. Members should refer to the council guidance on remote meetings. It outlines how important processes such as asking questions and voting are carried out in this meeting. As a reminder, members, please remember the following. Please mute your microphone when you're not speaking. Please keep your camera on at all times. If you wish to uh, wish to speak, please use the raised hands feature or meeting chat so that the Democratic Services will confirm your request, giving a thumbs up. I would like to introduce the participants to this meeting for the benefit of most of the public, both who may be watching the webcast. The officers on the call are Caroline Smith, who's the Planning Development Control Manager, Stephen Jenkins, Planning Development Manager, David Maxwell, Senior Planning Officer, Andy Stokes, Transport Development Planning Team Lead, Nancy Ossatoria, Principal Lawyer, if you guys have a chance to that as well, Samantha Murphy, Planning Development Team Lead, Jessica Delarville, Planning Officer, Vicky Hibbert, Governance Manager, Josh Butler, Committee Manager, and as the computer was given up last night, Ernest Malik is, is joining us in the room as well, which is nice. And, uh, so, uh, members for the sake of the live feed, can I please ask you to confirm your attendance at today's meeting? Stephen Cooksey? Yes, I am present. Tim Evans? Yes, I'm here, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Yvonne Lady? Yes, I'm here, Chairman. <clears throat> Ernest, you're here? Yes. Good. Bernie Muir? Present. So, Present. Penny Rivers. Present. Keith Taylor. Present. And Rose Thorne. Present. Chairman, you didn't call my name. Oh, I'm sorry. I bet you are going to see what you have Andrew Povey. Present. Apologies for absence of substitutions. We have apologies from Mary Angel. And Yvonne Alain has come back for a second stint of the Loxley Oil Well. Minutes of the last meeting, can I confirm? Sign the minutes of the last meeting held the 22nd of October. Can I approve? Petitions we have none. Public questions we have none. Member questions we have none. Declarations of interest. Uh, yes, yeah, Chairman, I declare an interest as a trustee of the Surrey Hills Society. Thank you, Dr. Povey. Right. Um, we now get to item seven, Minerals and Waste Application WA 2019-0796, Loxley Well Site, land south of Dunspold Road and east of High Loxley Road, Dunspold. The construction, operation and decommissioning of a well site for the exploration and appraisal of hydrocarbon minerals from one exploratory borehole, Loxley 1, and one side track borehole, Loxley 1Z, for a temporary period of three years, involving the siting of plant and equipment, the construction of a new access track, a new highway junction with High Loxley Road, highway improvements at the junction of High Loxley Road, Dunsford Road, and the erection of a boundary fence and entrance gates with restoration to land uh, Could members please note there is an update sheet which was circulated yesterday. We are working on the basis that we will do at least an hour and probably have a break at that point, but we will see how the discussion is going. And uh, Nancy Alfatori will give us a quick update on things. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, 
Uh, members and members of the public, uh, my name is Nancy Oshaturi. As Principal Planning Solicitor, regularly advising members of this committee, I have been asked to summarise the legal position in relation to the item before you, before members today. Um, Council was instructed to advise following the Planning Committee meeting of the 29th of June. As members will recall, this was the first remote Planning and Regulatory Committee meeting. Uh, members resolved to go against officer recommendation and refuse the application by a majority of six votes to five. Many individual complaints were received subsequently, alleging procedural irregularities that the complainants asserted invalidated the result. The applicant's lawyers wrote to us to the effect that the committee resolution was unlawful and that it should be referred back to committee for redetermination. The applicant was considering its options, which included a judicial review of the committee decision, an appeal against refusal on the basis that the decision was unlawful and not based on any objective analysis, um, for, and formal complaints regarding conduct of the committee and conduct of certain individual members. Following this, um, council, legal counsel met officers and was asked to view the recording of the meeting to consider if there were any such irregularities and if so, what should be done to rectify them. While noting the reluctance of the courts to scrutinise planning committee meeting deliber deliberations in a forensic manner, the understandable difficulties of holding the first remote planning committee in the county and technical glitches. Council was concerned that certain members voted who may not have been present throughout the consideration of the item in breach of our code of best practice in planning procedures and as required by the 2020 coronavirus regulations governing remote committees because it appeared at times that they could not hear and be heard. Those votes clearly made a difference to the outcome given the close vote. Council concluded therefore that there was a significant likelihood that a court would on those issues alone declare the resolution as invalid and unlawful. However, she also highlighted other matters that might um, be of concern to a court, i.e. that a local member is limited to speaking for three minutes and cannot subsequently participate in the committee, that parts of the debate may have been missed by members, some members appear to have other members of the household with them and communicating with them, appearing on the screen, raising the perception of unfairness, and the use of the chat log, potentially allowing private chat between participants. As no decision notice had been issued, Council confirmed that the resolution had no effect. She furthermore stressed that a local authority may have a duty to reconsider its decision if flaws in decision making are brought to its attention before a decision notice is issued. Council advised that a local authority may therefore revoke a resolution to grant or refuse and may then redetermine an application before issuing its decision. On any redetermination, she stressed that members of the public and the applicant should be able to make or remake their statements orally and there should be full provision for debate by members. Technical problems should be resolved so that everyone could hear and be heard throughout. No others should be present with councillors, although if there is a need for assistance, for example, because of disability, this should be raised with the chair in advance and the chat function should be used appropriately. This should ensure that any future remote access to the meeting is conducted in a fully fair manner. Uh, the county's director of legal services and monitoring officer advised on the strength of council's advice that the applicant should be the application, sorry, should be determined afresh by the planning and regulatory committee, and um, that is where we are now today. Um, given that it's likely that 
Um, sorry, it is the case that many of the same members will be voting today as voted previously. The issue of predetermination needs to be touched upon, uh, given the, the expectation that the application will be considered afresh entirely fairly. I would therefore like to remind members of some points in relation to predetermination as well as lobbying. As part of the legal training members received before sitting on this committee, they have all had training in bias, predisposition and predetermination. As a condition of sitting on the committee, members signed up to Surrey's Code of Best Practice in Planning Procedures, which makes clear that they should keep an open mind when considering applications in accordance with relevant planning considerations. Members have their own copy of the code. Um, whatever their views, councillors will approach their decision making with an open mind in the sense that they must have regard to all material considerations and be prepared to change their views if persuaded by the evidence before them, the representations made and the debate engaged in. Members who previously have done something that might directly or indirectly indicate what view they took would or might take in relation to a matter and the matter was relevant to the decision but who came to the committee prepared to hear all relevant considerations will not be perceived to have a closed mind when voting on the application. It is important to stress that the minds of members be open to any new argument at all times up to the moment of decision. Turning now to lobbying, where members are encouraged to vote in a particular way by objectors or supporters, the Members' Code of Conduct stresses the need to be impartial and to be seen to be impartial when carrying out public duties. Members understand that they must not favour any person, company, group or locality. Finally, we are reminded by our Code of Best Practice that when members are minded to go against officer recommendation, and I'm just quoting from the Code, the Chair must summarise or cause to be summarised the salient points of the debate and ensure the text of the proposition is clearly understood before putting the matter to the vote. The chair will therefore summarise before the vote should such a situation arise today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Right. Uh, we have six members of the public registered to speak on this application, five in objection, one in support. A reminder to the speakers, please switch on your microphone and camera when you're called and turn them off when you've finished. The committee manager will sound a bell and there's one minute left and two bells when your time is up. If you encounter any technical difficulties, please try leaving and rejoining the meeting. We, are, we also have given officers a number if you can, for support if you need it. So therefore, can I start by inviting public speakers? we we'll start with Sarah, Sarah Gordon. Sarah. Thank you. I have lived in Dunsville for 27 years. It's an unspoilt village, just one and a half kilometres from the proposed drill site, situated in the Surrey Hills area of great landscape value and bordering the AONB. Under the Waverley Local Plan Policy RE3, this area has the same principles for protection until its corporation into the AONB is reviewed. From the officer's report, we know representations sent by objectors are over 80% of the total. But in my view, the revised report fails to give due consideration to issues raised, which demonstrate the significant adverse impact on our environment and amenities without a balance of positive benefits. Surrey's climate emergency strategy includes some objectives for our futures. One, residents live in clean, safe and green communities. Dunsfold and surrounds are just that, but this will change if an industrialised drill site is permitted. Two, journeys across the county are easier, predictable and safer. But if consent is given, large tankers will be turning into a narrow rural lane on a dangerous blind corner, already infamous locally for frequent accidents and a cause for serious concern. Three, businesses in Surrey thrive. UCOG makes some exaggerated and inflated claims in this application about its local and national importance, but the immediate adverse impact will be at demonstrable cost to three existing local businesses adjacent to the site, 
These are real costs with a real risk of being jeopardised by the development. An additional issue is the impact on Dunsfold Park Green Garden Village, a core pillar of Waverley's housing strategy. The viability of the whole village project will be literally undermined by the reality of a lateral shaft being drilled underneath it. Any negative impact on housing delivery here will send shockwaves throughout this part of Surrey, particularly areas outside the green belt. The applicant suggests we'll see benefits to the local economy, but it's unlikely during three years exploratory drilling. There's no guarantee of future production, therefore no guarantee of benefits. The government publicised its green revolution recently. Onshore drilling and fossil fuels do not feature in their new measures. The Surrey Minerals Plan has not changed since 2011 and is now due for review. UCOG has failed to offer a convincing explanation for how the Loxley scheme would benefit the climate crisis. Hydrogen is a buzzword, but conversion of any gas found there would only produce grey hydrogen, not clean green hydrogen. What we do in Surrey, in the UK, impacts across the globe and vice versa. Climate change does not recognise borders. So to conclude, such a speculative and potentially damaging drilling operation is neither justifiable nor in line with planning policy nor appropriate in 2020. Please vote to refuse this application. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tom Gordon. Thank you. High Loxley Road is a long meandering private lane edged with hedgerows, fields and wildflowers. It provides the practical approach that leads to High Bellinghurst Farm, the home where my family and I have invested our time, energy and savings in developing a very special wedding venue business, which has gained a unique and outstanding reputation. A wonderful approach and idyllic location with far reaching views towards Hascombe Hill and the AONB are key features that set us apart from many others. They create the very first impression of our venue. There is no doubt that considerably widening High Loxley Road, enough to accommodate two passing HGVs, the replacement of hedgerows with over 50 metres of security fencing, gates, traffic control, signage and artificial lighting will completely destroy the rural character and appearance of our approach. From clients that come to view during the week when weddings are not taking place, but the proposed site will be fully operational. It may only be 338 metres from my home, but the site itself will be less than 100 metres from our boundary, sitting directly between us and our views towards the OANB, which forms the backdrop for many of our outdoor wedding ceremonies. The noise, light and odour will be relentless. This speculative exploration site cannot be compared with producing sites such as Storrington or Albury, which have been established for over 30 years, are half the size, completely shielded by woodland on all sides, and without houses or businesses in close proximity, which would be negatively affected by the development. The 37 metre high oil rig will be in direct line of sight and earshot of our home, our wedding venue. Our rural setting will be ruined, having an immediate and devastating impact on our business, our reputation and our livelihood. Our venue attracts couples from all over the country and we're licensed to hold up to 50 events a year, with up to 8,000 visiting guests from all over the world. And I would estimate that we conservatively generate in the region of three and a half to four million pounds a year, for the many businesses and suppliers that all help to support our events, the vast majority of which are Surrey based in Surrey. Caterers, local food producers, serving staff, typically about 20 per event, florists, stylists, dressmakers, marquee companies, musicians, event planners, technicians, celebrants, photographers, hotels, B&Bs, drink suppliers, including our neighbour at the Crafty Brewing Company, mobile bars, pubs, taxis, not least of all, the local parish council, uh, sorry, churches, where ceremonies often take place, bringing them essential income and outreach. This is a business that we intend to grow, and venues as unique as ours are very few and far between. And so the revenue that our business attracts to this part of Surrey will simply vanish. Permitting this application will, only, will not only severely impact our business, but many, many others locally. I would therefore urge you to please consider this when making your decision and refuse the speculative application because the adverse impacts clearly outweigh any possible benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Well in time as well, which is always nice. Um, Ashley Hearn, next speaker. You're still mute, sir. You're still mute.
Mr Herman, we can't hear you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Shall I start again? Please. Thank you. 18 months ago, Brian Alexander, UCOG's PR executive, told me they'd chosen the site because it's in the middle of nowhere. But it isn't. It lies within the heart of a community. Three farms, two gypsy Roma and traveller settlements comprising 85 homes and their voices have long been ignored in this matter. 360 of us living within 500 metres of a hydrocarbon site. My home, Thatched House Farm, is only 230 metres away. And like High Billinghurst, we have established farm diversification projects. In addition to keeping livestock, we established the True Fields Cancer Awareness Festival, which attracts a thousand people annually and is attended by health professionals, NHS practitioners, cancer sufferers and their families. Hundreds more come to our follow up events and retreats throughout the year. Its campsite is just 100 metres from UCOG's proposed oil and gas well. Our brewery, the Crafty Brewing Company, makes award winning beers, supplying local pubs, restaurants, Surrey search and rescue supporters, military regiments and online customers. We employ 12 full time and 42 part time people, all of them local. True Fields introduces £177,000 to the local economy each year and the brewery has sales approaching a million. We have diversified. We've created employment whilst retaining agricultural and artisan usage and are in compliance with saved policy RD8, which states that farm diversification must not have an adverse effect on the character and amenity of an area. Covid may have damaged us, but hydrocarbon drilling in the field next to us would be the final straw. True fields will become untenable and Crafty's summer evening events will become less attractive. And who can say with certainty that the freshwater borehole we need to drill, our wells and ponds will not be at risk from contamination, that we won't be subjected to noise and odour from the hydrocarbon well site. The MPPF requires the weighing of national economic benefit, yes, but against local harm. And even if the need had been demonstrated, the Surrey Minerals Plan, MC14, advises that if there are significant adverse impacts of mineral development on communities and the environment, permission should be refused. The officers may recommend consent, but you have the right to differ. And fear of an appeal is not a valid reason not to do so. The NPPF and Mineral Plan frameworks both provide valid legal reasons for refusal. And I would ask you to engage these because consent to this hydrocarbon well site and Tom's and my rural businesses with combined contributions of £4.5 million each year to the local economy will be crippled. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Chris Britton. Is my mic on? Yes. Thank you. Okay. As a local resident living 900 metres east of the site, I wish to represent the huge number of local people directly threatened by the oil well's impact, whose voices continue to be airbrushed out, both in scale and significance. Ashley referred to the community with protected characteristics, whose most recent petition represented 140 residents, including children, against this application. They have at no point been directly consulted by the County Council. In total, some 400 people live within 500 metres of the site, to which will soon be added thousands more at Dunsfold Garden Village. They will all be blighted by noise and pollution above ground and the well directly beneath them. Oldfold, Cranley and neighbouring parishes, totalling over 15,000 people and Waverley Borough Council have all strongly objected. The opposition to this is deafening. Yet the officer's report dismisses all concerns of harm, preferring to trust the word of the applicant. Today, councillors, you can change that. Your decision is on a matter of balance. Take traffic and sustainability. Any layman visiting High Loxley Lane can picture the risks of HGVs, including abnormal loads, attempting to use this narrow lane. Yet the response by officers has been dismissive. 
Over several months, despite being given factual evidence exposing flaws in the applicant's plans for accessibility and questioning the use of banksmen to control HGVs at the four-arm blind junction at Pratt's Corner, the council still has not updated its 2018 road safety audit. The blind bends on the B2130 will force HGVs into the path of oncoming traffic, but officers say these bends can be safely negotiated. They contend it's acceptable to put off traffic matters until later. Facts show this to be a false and unsound premise. This is not the first time the council has been misled by UCOG. A traffic management plan approved by SDC in October for the Horse Hill drill site was flouted just days later when an abnormal load vehicle was photographed overriding verges and grounding on a busy road without any traffic management. Evidence you've seen yourselves. Your policy MC15 requires you members to satisfy yourselves that the highway network is of an appropriate standard for use by the traffic generated by the development. And if deficient, that you have proposals for suitable improvement. Yet you have seen no firm proposals to mitigate these very real risks. Using banksman is completely different to previous proposals and should have been subject to a full road safety audit and a draft section 278. But for five months since first being mentioned, the council has preferred to take the word of the applicant to undertaking proper due diligence. Members, you cannot take this gamble. You should refuse this application on the grounds of both policy MC12 and MC15 because vehicular activity and vehicle routing have not been properly addressed. And there will be significant adverse impacts on highway safety, residential safety, the environment and the effective operation of the highway network. Today, you can choose to preserve our local rural community or permit a speculative and harmful venture with no demonstrable benefit. Thank you. Thank you. And the last speaker against is John Gray. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the application site on the edge of the Surrey Hills AONB is not strategic. It offers very speculative volumes and will not balance the harm caused by these wells. The site's not well located. No new data has been generated to justify the volume claims made by UCOG as against the knowledge gained from the Godley Bridge and Oldfold wells and the rebuttal evidence made by Dr. Seaburn. Dr. Seaburn, a retired oil and gas professional, challenged the validity of the volumes and the way that UCOG referred selectively and used as evidence an independent study by consultants Exeter. Dr. Seaborn wrote the content of the UCOG release is in stark contrast to the Exodus 2018 competent person statement publicly available, which unequivocally stated that the mapping is not in accord with observed facts and that the available data are insufficient to allow a reasonable reserve estimate to be made. Dr. Seaborn went on to say that in September 2020, we're told that UCOG has changed its position and we're now looking at the second largest onshore UK gas accumulation. The assertion lacks supporting evidence in the form of public access to the Exodus report that they refer to. UCOG planned to produce hydrogen, that's grey hydrogen, as distinct from green. In hydrogen from natural gas, the carbon element has to be removed and stored. And this, this is more suitable for offshore than onshore drilling. UCOG claimed the investment of six million over a three year period will benefit the community, which in the absence of evidence, I contend will be mostly spent with specialist contractors outside of Surrey. As against the impact on the two local businesses whose loss will impact for many years and conservatively will be two to three times that of the UCOG investment. Both local businesses have figures available to support the statement. However, the officer has not included an impact statement in his report. UCOG's application is already showing up on land searches. The application site overlooks Dunsfold Garden Village, 1,800 houses and 4,000 new residents. The success of this site is critical to Waverley local plan and the need to show a high five-year housing supply. Any impact on the building out of this site will impact on the whole of Waverley and the success of the garden village with its many green credentials. The application, if improved, will damage local businesses, expose local residents to the impact of 24-hour operation of the well 
and will pose an industrial structure on the edge of the AONB and risk the success of the development at Dunsfold Pope. Any planning application is a balance, a balance, and I urge you to see that the benefits of this method of drilling do not outweigh the harm to local or a national level and reject this application. Thank you, members. Thank you. Right. We now call Ashley Ward, who is speaking in favour of the application. Thank you, Chairman. Can you see me? We can, we can hear you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I am Ashley Ward. My family owns Farmers Direct Limited, and we farm at High Loxley, along with other land in and around Dunsfold. I also own the land at the proposed well site. We farm a lot of livestock and produce high quality beef and lambs, which we sell to a wide range of customers throughout the United Kingdom. We are committed to higher tier stewardship with Natural England, enhancing the soil and biodiversity. I have environmental qualifications and four generations of my family have farmed in the area for over 100 years. I consider that we are a cornerstone of the rural economy. Farming is challenged by Brexit and cheap food from anywhere in the world. It is also at the forefront of carbon management as we move towards a low carbon economy and future. Initiatives here on our farm include the planting and management of miles of hedges and new trees, and these are helping to already store carbon. Furthermore, our methods of increasing soil organic matter can directly equate to carbon sequestration into the soil. UK farming is acting on climate change and delivering our food security. UK oil and gas companies are embracing a hydrogen future and carbon capture storage. It will be part of the solution to winning against climate change in the future. We should be encouraging UCOG in their role uh, in energy security and also addressing the transition to a low carbon future alongside British farmers. The roads to High Loxley are perfectly suitable for HGVs. I know this because the animals that go in and out of my farm do so on HGVs, the largest of which are as big as any vehicle legally permitted on our roads. Large HGVs come and go to my farm easily without adverse effects of free flow or safety on the highway. Our roads are suitable and it would be unreasonable to claim otherwise. This site is not going to destroy local businesses as some claim. I have worked with UCOG for over three years and they have been very good neighbours. They are supporting my business and our environment and this is at the forefront of their agreement with me and this proposal. No other diversification on my land has the potential to bring so much investment and expenditure into our area. Furthermore, just south of here is Paulborough Rugby Club. The beautiful clubhouse hosts hundreds of events and is a great place to have a beer. Interestingly, about 100 metres from the clubhouse and not far from Storrington is Storrington Oil and Gas Well Site. It has been there for some 30 years, pretty well unnoticed. So I say to my neighbours and other businesses, I am pretty clear that UCOG do not pose the threats that are claimed. UCOG's application has complied with every aspect of planning and regulation. This proposal is a credit to their management and their professional teams. Surrey County Council's own team of professionals and policy scrutineers recommend approval with good reason. Chairman and members of the, uh, and, and members of the committee, this application should be approved and I encourage you to approve it here today. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from the applicants, agents, Stephen Sanderson, Nigel Moore. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Nigel. Good morning. Um, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the planning committee. My name is Nigel Moore. I'm a Chartered Town Planner and part of the Loxley design team. The applicant accepts without reservation the concerns expressed at the June committee. And I will now present additional measures 
that address those concerns in the hope of demonstrating Loxley to be a development worthy of your support. Firstly, members were not convinced of the need for gas exploration. In response, there are two pieces of key evidence to consider. Firstly, the historic exploration at Godley Bridge and Oldfold in the 1980s confirmed the presence of gas. And secondly, the geology is similar to that of Horse Hill, a known discovery that is now in production. As you've heard, some dispute this evidence. They suggest that site selection is done by simply putting a pin in the map and then drilling for fun. This is misguided. The applicant is willing to invest £6 million in the name of exploration. The role of the planning process is to consider if this is an acceptable use of the land and not to speculate about whether or not the resource exists. Without this spirit of exploration, nothing would ever get done and we would all be poorer as a result. In the applicant's opinion, such speculation about the resource is without foundation and should be given little, if any, weight in the planning balance. Having studied the evidence before us, the applicant confirms that, the Lox, that Loxley is a known reserve of domestic gas, but add to this evidence the following considerations. Exploration cannot be footloose. We must follow the resource. Exploration is a matter of national importance. National energy policy describes it as critical. This is a word where rarely used in policy, but it's justified in this context because we need gas now to keep the lights on. And we'll need it in the future because we'll still consume 70% of the gas we do today in the year 2050, the year when we are meant to become a net zero gas emitter, greenhouse gas emitter. Now, the UK is currently a net importer of gas. And if we if we do nothing about this in 2050, we'll be dependent upon other countries for 86 percent of our supply. Given that gas is a commodity, for, given that gas is a key commodity for our manufacturing base and it heats our homes, hospitals and schools, this level of exposure would amount to a national security risk, as any interruption in supply would have a significant and adverse impact on our economy and social well-being. Domestic gas is therefore the insurance policy we need to protect ourselves from any external threat to turn the taps off or spike the prices. But this historic economic concern is now joined by a more pressing environmental concern because the liquefied natural gas we import from the United States, Russia and the Gulf has a greenhouse gas content four to five times higher than UK gas. Now, we have the best regulatory system in the world, but this this, this is bypassed in a second the minute we choose to import. And we can do wonderful things with our environment, but it counts for nothing if we continue to import environmental destruction through our, our commodities. Accordingly, relying on imports makes no economic sense, but it's worse than that because we now know that it will harm our environment. Contrast this with an alternative future where sites like Loxley restore our gas sovereignty, secure our supplies and clean up our supply chains. Loxley is therefore precisely the kind of site that should be explored, given that gas is critical to our current and future prosperity. Secondly, members express concerns with regard to the highway. Planning conditions now dictate that all HGVs enter and exit the site from the east to avoid all rural roads to the west. They are digitally tracked to ensure they will stick to the route. Verges will be protected, junctions will be improved and wheels washed. At the last committee, Mr Gordon spoke of the need for his clear access to High Loxley Road on a Friday in connection with his events at High Billinghurst Farm. In response, there will be no HGV movements from Friday noon onwards, leaving the long weekends free for Mr Gordon's activities. Mr Herman has confirmed that the True Fields Festival will be held on the, from the 2nd to the 4th of July in 2021. In response, the applicant will cease all operations and commits to do so in the, and commits to do the same in the years two and three. Signage is in place to deter HGVs from using Marwick Lane as a rat run, but this is not meant to restrict HG movements elsewhere. 934 HGVs use Dunf Dunsfall Road on a weekly basis. An additional 10 HG HGVs per day would not materially add to this. Speeding, speeding cars are the reasons why chevrons have been installed on bends. There have been no accidents involving HGVs because Dunsville Road is sufficiently wide to accommodate these vehicles. 
In summary, the evidence demonstrates that the local road network can acceptably accommodate this development. But don't take our word for it. Please interrogate your officers. Members express concerns for noise and air emissions. Both have been the subject of independent assessment with which the Council's Environmental Health Officer agrees and the Environment Agency have since issued a permit for this activity. Last but not least, the rural economy. As stated, the planned expenditure at Loxley is £6 million. Given that the economic emergency, given the economic emergency outlined by the, by the Chancellor this week, the prospect for other investments of this scale in the rural economy appears slim. So the applicant will adopt a presumption in favour of using local firms to keep this expenditure within the local rural economy. In summary, conditions are in place to ensure the site operates as predicted, but the applicant is willing to accept further conditions if members consider it necessary. Members can be confident that this suite of conditions will work because of the well of trust built up at Horse Hill, a similar site operational since 2004, but with no breach of conditions, contrary to the, evident, contrary to the ten, testimony, testimony previously given. Loxley would be sympathetically managed with the same spirit of goodwill to ensure the same harmonious outcome. In conclusion, UK gas cleanest gas and it's the cheapest gas. It makes no sense to keep shipping it in from afar. If approved, Loxley would progress in full compliance with your minerals plan, but it has the potential to do so much more than this because we no longer need to choose between protecting the economy or the environment. Loxley would allow us to keep the lights on while we cut emissions without any impoverishment or loss of personal freedom. In short, we can have our cake and eat it. Thank you for listening. Right. Okay. Uh, Steve, yes. Yes, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? You can hear you. I can see you. Okay. Okay. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair, members, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Stephen Sanderson, and I'm the CEO of UK Oil and Gas, a Surrey company employing mostly local people, including myself, with the sole purpose of providing energy for Britain. Firstly, be assured that like our activities at Horse Hill, Loxley Gas Appraisal would progress responsibly and in full compliance with your minerals plan and other regulators. Those of you who've seen Horse Hill and other similar sites will know that they are visually unobtrusive, have low lifetime traffic flows and are generally well below most residents' radar. Loxley also has a full environment agency permit which should provide comfort that the local environment will remain unharmed by this development. Your officers concur with this. So, ladies and gentlemen, given our climate emergency, why do we need Loxley or any natural gas development? In a nutshell, because new technologies make natural gas a key part of the UK net zero solution. Natural gas is a critical future use as a feedstock to manufacture low carbon hydrogen, which can be used to generate electricity to prevent power outages when wind turbines stand still or the sun goes down on solar farms. Low carbon hydrogen forms a key part of government energy strategy, as demonstrated by last week's 10 point Green Industrial Revolution Plan, the Chancellor's National Infrastructure Statement on Wednesday, and last November's written ministerial statement from the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. All establish the importance of natural gas as a hydrogen feedstock. I quote the Secretary of State, the Committee on Climate Change predict that we will still consume almost 70 percent of the gas we consume today in 2050 under our net zero target, as significant reductions across building, industry and power are offset by demand for gas to produce hydrogen. It is therefore critical that the UK continues to have good access to natural gas from both domestic and international markets. As well as a feedstock for hydrogen manufacture, natural gas also provides a key source of available affordable energy to bridge the transitional gap before low carbon technologies are in place. Domestic gas is also markedly better for net zero than imports, as liquefied natural gas and long distance pipeline imports 
have four to five times the greenhouse gas footprint. Imports also make no direct contribution to the economy via jobs or taxes and do not have the same security of supply. By providing fuel for hydrogen manufacture, domestic gas fields such as Loxley can therefore not only help meet net zero, but as part of the green industrial revolution, can help offset the £270 billion pound cost of, of the up to 86% import dependency to 2050 and help repay the £394 billion of COVID debt. Therefore, there is a demonstrable need for domestic gas from Loxley. As the second largest gas accumulation drilled and tested in the UK onshore, Loxley's potential peak gas supply would have an energy equivalent to power around 200,000 homes per year and provide up to £30 million per year in gas sales to hydrogen manufacture and carbon capture plants, all of which are likely to be situated in key industrial hubs well outside of the Loxley rural area. Loxley could thus be a materially significant future contributor to the, contributor to the local and Surrey-wide revenue base and economy. It should be no surprise that this proposal in this locality attracts objection. However, as pointed out by Ashley Ward, a fourth generation local farmer, no other diversification on my land has the potential to bring so much investment and expenditure into the area. Consequently, with your help members, the area's rural economy can be allowed to adapt and change to meet current needs and future challenges rather than be simply preserved in aspect like a museum piece. Loxley's potential role in the low carbon hydrogen future should therefore be considered in your decision. I also kindly remind you that national planning policy requires you as decision makers to give great weight to the benefits of such developments in recognition of the critical role gas plays in the nation's current and future life. I reiterate that Loxley's local economic contribution is potentially materially significant. Your officer's thorough and balanced report also finds that the many further concessions and mitigations we've offered strengthens the case for your approval, and that by virtue of sensitive site selection and considerate site design, the environmental effects of Loxley are insignificant, temporary and reversible. In contrast, Loxley's local economic contribution is potentially materially significant. In reaching a decision, I therefore hope that any personal opinions and perceptions do not trump the professional judgment and conclusions of your highways, environmental health and planning officers. Finally, please be as courageous as you are honest in your decision making. Please support Loxley to help secure gas for tomorrow's hydrogen. Help us contribute to net zero so Loxley can become an integral part of the build back better future we and our children so desperately need. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Therefore, call upon Victoria Young as the local member to speak. Victoria. Thank you very much. You have already heard from six local residents. As the member for Waverley Eastern Villages, I wish to voice my concerns on behalf of all the other local residents including those soon to move into the Dunsfold Park Garden Village. Indeed, if this application is approved, the projected deliverability of the Dunsfold Park Garden Village, a development of up to 2,600 homes central to Waverley's local plan, is called into question. I represent a rural division where the value in people's lives is not measured in monetary terms, but in the beauty and tranquility of the environment and the fresh air they breathe. While blessed with wonderful countryside, this area suffers from a lack of employment opportunities and many local businesses have been badly affected by COVID-19. However, this is not some rural backwater. Within it are strong communities which will be deeply affected by this development. The impact on local residents is a key concern to me. I was surprised to discover prior to the June hearing 
that the adjacent Gypsy and Traveller community at Stovold Hill and Lydia Park, about 340 people in total, had not been consulted. I'm still more amazed to find out that five months on, and they have still not been consulted. There is a farm, a brewery, and wedding and event venue very close to the site. The wedding venue alone, which relies on its unique location and uninterrupted views of the AONB, generates at least three and a half million pounds per year revenue for the wider local economy. The loss of this business will have a huge knock on effect for the large number of small local businesses that service it. There is also a unique international cancer awareness festival which works to support the NHS, but this will no longer be feasible in this part of the country if the development goes ahead. The site is adjacent to the Surrey Hills AONB, and whilst currently partly screened, much of this screening is from a wood due to be reduced under an approved forestry plan and an adjacent area of protected ancient woodland. There is an outstanding view from Hascombe Hill which will overlook the site. The site is an AGLV location which under Waverley's local plan policy RE3 is to be offered the same protection as that afforded to the AONB. The introduction of a highly visible industrial site would be severely detrimental to the landscape and enjoyment of the countryside. The impact of large vehicles on rural roads cannot be underestimated. Councillors, what you are being asked to accept is a plan to allow access to the site by 50 tonne articulated lorries swinging out into the oncoming traffic around several blind corners. You are being asked to allow the applicant and officer to sort out the details of the traffic management after approval is granted. The sketchy outline involves temporary traffic lights at some times and a banksman with a sign at others. These arrangements have not been subject to a road safety audit and many highways professionals are unhappy with them, despite what is said by the highways officers. In the end, councillors, your job is to weigh up the pros and cons of this application, but I put it to you that the known harm is greater than any be benefit ever might be. Thank you. Now I'd like David Maxwell to introduce the report. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the application is for the development of a new well site for the exploration and appraisal of hydrocarbon minerals using conventional methods for a temporary period of three years with restoration to agriculture. It involves the drilling of one exploratory borehole and one sidetrack borehole. The primary target for exploration is gas from the Portland sandstone. Secondary target is oil from the deeper Kimberidge limestone formation. The purpose of the application is to ascertain the volume and quality of any hydrocarbons present. This will inform the, applica the applicant as to whether the reserves are capable of being produced on a commercial basis over a longer time period. However, the impact of of medium to longer term hydrocarbon production cannot be taken into account in consideration of this application. This is because this would be subject to a separate planning application to be submitted at a later date. The site comprises worked agricultural land. It is located in a rural landscape in countryside beyond the Greenbelt and approximately one mile northeast of Dunsfold in southwest Surrey. The site is de designated locally as an area of great landscape value and situated within the setting of the Surrey Hills area of outstanding natural beauty. However, the site is not located in a statutorily designated area for its landscape or nature conservation importance. The well site compound would be situated, situated to the south and west of four established woodland blocks, three of which are subject of a PFL license granted to the Haston Estate from the Forestry Commission. However, the clear felling of all three woodland compartments within one felling operation is prohibited, as the restocking at neighbouring compartments needs to have a height of two metres before any adjacent areas can be felled. The site would be accessed from a new junction to be constructed on High Loxley Road to the west. To facilitate HGV access, some minor highway improvements would be required to the junction of Dunsfold Road and High Loxley Road. 
some carriageway widening on High Locksley Road will also be required within the existing highway verge. The proposal would result in up to 20 HTV movements per day, and all lorry traffic would be routed by Dunsfeld Road and the A281 to the east. HGVs will only access and egress the site between the hours of 9am and 5pm on Monday to Friday, and 9am and 1pm on Fridays and Saturdays. Three large residential properties are situated within the vicinity of the site, which between them contain seven Grade 2 listed buildings. Two of these also contain a number of rural businesses. There are also Gypsy and Traveller communities at Lydia Park, and New Acres to the east of Stovills Hill. Phase two of the development, which comprises drilling, testing and appraisal, which involves periods of 24 hour operations. When required, the need for nighttime working will be minimized and of a temporary and intermittent nature. The taller structures would comprise a 38 meter drilling rig and potentially a 42 meter crane but they would only be required for part of the time. The oil and gas industry is heavily regulated. It requires a range of licenses, permits and consents from a number of regulators. The Environment Agency issued an environmental permit for the site in June 2020, which sets out conditions in relation to risk man management, the permitted activities, operating techniques, emissions to water, air or land, odour, noise, vibration and monitoring. The role of the Mineral Planning Authority is to focus on whether the, whether the proposed development is an acceptable use of the land rather than the control of processes or emissions where these are subject to separate pollution control regimes. Planning decisions should assume that these regimes will operate effectively. The County Planning Authority has adopted a formal EIA screening opinion. This concludes that the development does not need an, an environmental impact assessment based on the requirements of environmental permitting regulations. The location of the application site was informed following an assessment of 23 potential sites of least constraint and based on the principles of minimising environmental and community impacts. Officers consider that there is a demonstrable need for the development and that significant weight should be attributed to this aspect of the, of the proposal, which is considered to be in the national interest and would result in wider public benefits. Officers also conclude that the potential would not conflict with the climate change agenda acknowledge that climate change and energy policies are interlinked. There are no technical objections to the application from consultees, including the Environment Agency, the Lead Local Flood Authority, the County Air Quality Consultant and the County Noise Consultant, the County Landscaping Consultant, the County Lighting Consultant and the County Highway Authority, neither of which have raised any objection to the application. The Borough Council has objected to the application Objections have been received from six local parish councils and, and a number of amenity groups. Over 660 representations have been received, 84% of which object to the development for, for, for a wide range of reasons, with around 16% in support. Officers acknowledge that the development will have some adverse impacts on the environment and amenity, but following a thorough assessment, are satisfied that these would not be significant. The applicant the application has been carefully reviewed by a number of consultees, including those providing specialist technical advice. Where concerns have been expressed, these have been addressed by the applicant and subsequently found to be capable of being resolved through the provision of mitigation measures and the imposition of planning conditions where necessary. Taking into account the specialist advice provided by consultees on technical matters, the assessment of government planning policy and national and local development plan policies, the demonstrable need for the development and the mitigation measures proposed by the applicant, officers recommend that the application be permitted, subject to conditions to protect the environment and local immunity. Um, since, um, noon yesterday, which is the cut-off period for the submission of responses on the application. We have received two further responses. Uh, we're not required to uh, report these to committee, but um, officers are, are required to review them before a decision notice is, is issued. I will just very briefly refer to them um, because they both 
cover issues that have largely, uh, which have previously been um, previous uh, responses. One is from the Gypsy Traveller, the Gypsy Yoga and Traveller community, which is a petition um, signed by 39 people. Um, the points raised are the same as those included in a previous submission um, we received on the 28th of August, which is publicly available. It's on Waverley Borough Council's website. Um, the, the permission refers to the letter and those signing state they support the views in the letter. And that the petition includes details of a number of children under 16 in each household of the person who has signed. And the other late representations from Dunstable Airport Limited. Um, again, repeating the points they've raised previously, um, but um, going into a bit more detail on an issue that we've already heard this morning. It's, it's concerns about the impact on the Dunstable Park development, the new settlement, in terms of um, the actual effect on, 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 on Waverley's housing strategy and, and the impact of killing uh, beneath people's homes uh, might, might have um, on the ability of, uh, on the ability to actually you know, sell sell houses um, at the site. I've got some presentation slides. So this is a site location plan and application. Sorry, we've skipped through to Aerial 1. Um, Aerial 1 shows satellite image with the site boundary, including the access and highway works at Pratt's Corner, which just squeezed inside the, uh, the red circle um, towards the, north the northwest corner. And next slide, please. Aerial 2, uh, this is a close-up satellite image of the application, application site boundary. Over to the right-hand side, you can see the main dwelling house, a Dutch house farm in the top right corner. The dwelling, the, this dwelling is the closest house to the well site compound. And it's located about 330 metres away from the centre of the compound. The compound is shown as the red square in the bottom right-hand corner. And in between these two features, the Birchett's woodland block is clearly visible. Next slide, please. Figure one shows the well site host field looking in the northeast. The field contains a ridge along the centre, line from east to west at 70, 72 metres. The compound would be constructed on the northern half of the field at 68 metres AOD. The wild bird seed mix plantation is clearly visible and would provide additional screening of up to, up to around 2.1 metres on top of the 70, 72 metre AOD ridge line. With the exception of the taller structures, this helps to screen views of the well site from the south, including from High Billingshurst Farm, the events venue, and the public bridleway right to the south. Next slide, please. Figure two this shows where the access will be on the western boundary of the site compound. It also gives some indication of the single line of trees along, along the northern boundary that will be retained if the Birchett's woodland block is clear felled. This would provide some screening and filtering of views from the AOMB and Flatstash Flat Farm to the north, and officers consider this to be material in landscape terms. Next slide, please. Now, figure three, this shows the west western boundary of the well site compound, this time looking south and uphill towards the crest of the ridge. This is just useful in showing how the topography, in other words, the 72 metre AOD ridge line with planting on top, will help to screen views from High Billingshurst Farm, the events venue, and the public driveway to the south. Next slide, please. Figure four, this photo shows the western boundary of the Birchards would are looking north and along the route where the access track will go. Again, the topography of this field will help to partly screen any views of vehicles from High Luxury Road to the west. Elevated parts of the AOMB to the north are also visible. Uh, next slide, please. Figure five, this view looks east from High Loxley Road. The woodland block on the right is the Birchetts. And the access would cut across the field towards the northwest corner of the Birchetts, where it then turns south. The natural contours would help to screen any views of vehicles from the south. Next slide, please. 
This view looks north along the eastern boundary of the Wellsite host field. The woodland visible to the right will be retained. Trees here are around 18 metres high. Uh, next slide, please. Figure seven. This view looks west along the, the northern boundary of the Wellsite host field. With the possible exception of five ash trees, the outermost single line of trees are around 16 metres in height and will be retained, providing some screening of filtering of views from the north. Uh, next slide, please. Big 8 gives us different perspective. This view looks west and is taken from just inside the woodland edge near the northeast corner of the Wellside host field. The track itself and the woodland to the left of it will be retained, with the possible exception of five ash, tree, ash trees, and will partially screen views from the north if the birchets is clear filled. And next slide, please. Big 9, this view is taken from the public driveway that runs along the southern boundary of the Wellside host field and looks south towards High Biddingshurst Farm. The photograph is taken using an optical zoom, so the buildings are not as close as they appear in this uh, image. The main residence is around 390 metres to the south of the centre of the Wellsite compound. The build, building to the extreme left, left within the walled garden comprises a converted barn and comprises the events venue where weddings, funerals and corporate hospital, hospitality functions can be held. Uh, next slide, please. Figure 10, this photo looks south along Hylock Sea Road. The, the uh, proposed new junction and site entrance will be constructed between the two holly trees, clearly visible on the left hand side of Hylock Sea Road. Uh, next slide, please. Figure 11, this is a view looking east from Hylock Sea Road. Dutch Road, road lies uh, beyond the trees, lying to the left. On the horizon, just right of centre, it's just poss possible to see the red rooftop of Thatch House Farm which is the nearest property to the Wellsite compound. Next slide, please. Figure 12, this photo looks north along High Locksley Road, uh, from the other site entrance towards the junction with Dunswell Road, only just visible in the distance. Minor carriageway widening will be required in places within the existing highway verge. Following the, com the completion of the development, the road will be reinstated back to its original condition as shown. Next slide, please. Figure 13, this looks west from High Locksley Road at, at its junction with Dunsfold Road. And the junction with Dunsfold Common, Common Road, which leads to the centre of Dunsfold, is within 40 metres to the west, sorry, is visible 40 metres to the west on the left hand side. Next slide, please. Figure 14, this photo looks east along Dunsfold Road from its junction with High Locksley Road. The junction is subject to selective road widening within the highway extent to enable HGVs to negotiate this junction. Uh, next slide, please. Figure 15, this view is taken from the northern side of Dunsfold Road and looks south towards the junction with High Locksley Road opposite. And the final slide, figure 16, please. This shows a view looking west along Dunsfold Road. This is the route taken by HGVs approaching the site from the A281. Uh, traffic survey data indicates that Dunsfold Road already carries an average of 779 heavy vehicles a day between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday to Friday. To provide some context, the application would result in a maximum of 20 HGV movements per day. In terms of landscape, the land to the right or north of Dunsfold Road is designated as AOMB. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think at that point we probably ought to have a break. So if we break till 11.45, it gives it the six minutes or so to do. Thank you. We try and structure the in discussion. Um, we'd start with the first section, which was sort of policy and the need for the actual site. Any contributions on that? Questions? And so, right, Bernie, Bernie? 
Can you hear us? Yeah, just coming. Um, I don't know if my question actually fits into that, but you can tell me. Um, basically, the the argument from uh, the applicants um, is about the economic about the economic benefit and investments in the area, and that is um, one of the, if you like, the the needs of this project. One is the need for the um, actual um, hydrogen, etc. And the other is the need for the local community uh, in terms of investment and expenditure. Uh, I'm not going to comment on, on the hydrogen other than to ask the question, what is the difference between grey hydrogen and green hard, hard hydrogen? And does that, uh, where does that, where is that in the priority of fuels for the future? Right, that's helpful. That's your question. Um, we also have Penny Rivers and Tim Evans, so let's we'll, we'll group the questions and we'll see what what comes through. Penny Rivers. Thank you very much. Um, so on the environment and need. Um, I was just going to say I can accept that should oil and gas be found at this site, it might be um, of benefit to the nation. But the balance, surely, is the adverse effects on the locality. So I'd like a few, um, a bit of guidance on that, please. And Tim Evans. Right, yes. Sorry, yeah. Um, as you know, Chairman, I'm, I'm new to this. I was not on the committee in, in June when this was discussed before, so I'm sure everybody knows a great deal more about it than I do. But I'm, I'm, I'm still, my, my basic question as I've been all of this is simply, is the game worth the candle? And that seems to be the question that's been expressed in a number of different ways. The numbers that I've, I, I like, I like a good number, as you know, Chairman, uh, and the numbers seem to be very speculative in terms of what uh, can or cannot be produced from this site. And if I accept the applicant's numbers uh, of 200 billion cubic feet, if I've got that right, it's very hard to understand what that means in real terms. But one of the applicants uh, suggested that, uh, that by 2050, uh, we would need to be import, we'd be importing 86% of the gas to support our economy. And this was going, this, uh, this excavation was mitigated, always supposing it found what it's supposed to find. But I don't know if I have much. It doesn't seem, I haven't got any sense of, at all of the scale of whether the gas that they would produce would in fact change that 86% to, to extreme, to be 3% or maybe 85%. I just don't know because I, I don't understand the numbers well enough. So I would like some guidance on that. Um, everything that has been said talks about potential and speculation. And of course, I do understand you can't dig, uh, you can't do, you can't speculate where there isn't any expectation of there being anything. Um, but all of it comes back and others, I'm sure, will comment on is the damage to the wider community. And 84 percent of the people who have responded to this have been against it, who live around the area. Uh, is the damage to the wider community worth the effort that is going in? And that is the question I'm I'm wrestling with. Thank you. Chairman, I did have a part two to my question. Hello? Hello, we can hear you. I, I did have a part two to my question. Can I ask it? Yes, please. Sorry, I did answer you, but it disappeared yeah. into you. Uh, all right. So um, is this the wrong place to, because um, you, you were saying uh, policy of need, um, were you referring just to the exploration or the um, implied um, need by the applicant to the local economy? Because I've got quite a few comments on the local economy aspect of it. I think on that basis we might do this here because it seems to, be, it seems to fit. OK, so um, in the, the, the applicants um, uh, made some comments about um, in investment and expenditure in the local area. Um, they, it's referenced actually 
threaded throughout indeed this the considerable papers that came with this um whilst there are numbers thrown about i do not see how actually the what the local community actually gets their hands on that money maybe the, the farmer who owns the land um they there was a condition put in in page one one four which was i think rejected by the officers about local suppliers so that's um i would i'd be interested to know was this uh, condition put to the applicant and was it the applicant who sh did not wish to be confined to uh, local suppliers? Um, if not, there is still um, means that if there is no um, uh, push for them to have local suppliers, then there's no benefit to the community in that. Um, the, some, uh, the applicant said about... Um, you know, if this didn't go through, I suppose it was the equivalence. He was saying conserving the air and aspect. aspect. Um, and I, later on the line, I, and I do want to make um, a number of points about the fact that they are far from conserving their air and aspect. And they've got a growing business in that area. And uh, Billingshurst Farm, which employs um, probably hundreds of people through the suppliers, and directly uh, brings millions of pounds every year and indirectly millions more to the local community. And I don't see any kind of tie up with the kind of investment that um, UCOG is talking about coming into the local community. Um, it talks about not having an impact in the rural economy and, uh, and environment, what, what have you. But in the current um, climate, um, I think developing local businesses, um, and this is a business that can grow and grow um, over the, you know, the short term benefits. And I don't actually see any economic benefits to um, the local community from this um, from this uh, site. Um, and, and, and in fact, the local business I'm referring to, USP, is directly associated with the landscape and the area in the site. So, you know, you take one away, then you are taking a potentially long term, rapidly expanding business and replacing it for something speculative. So I I um, I really do need to understand what they are saying about how they are benefiting, not just the guy who owns the land, but the wider community. And what are those jobs? Because they're not being to, they, the, the condition to create those jobs in the local area was turned down by I don't know who. And I want to know who was the person who was the was it us at Surrey or was it UCOG who did not want that condition for local jobs to be uh, local suppliers to be a condition of this. Right. Uh, we have Penny Rivers, then Rose Thorne, and then Stephen Cooksey. Shall we? Oh, so perhaps we should answer, we'll answer some of those questions first and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll come first. I think right. Samantha's commented in the meeting chat about the definition of green hydrogen and grey hydrogen. So, so green hydrogen is renew from renewable energy and grey hydrogen is from fossil fuel. So that's the distinction between mm -hmm. the two. Right. Helpful. Okay. And other points? In respect of Tim Evans point, I think it's, it's important to remind members of what it says in the NPPF about um, facilitating uh, mineral extraction. Um, and it simply says, when determining planning applications, great weight should be given to the benefits of mineral, mineral extraction, including to the economy. So where the question is about, is the effort worth the impact? Just to remind members that great weight has to be given to the benefits of mineral extraction. Thank you, Carol. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I agree with the point about green and grey hydrogen. I would just make the point that um, we've assessed the application that's been submitted and, and the amended documents um, listed in the officer report. Um, we have not assessed information made in statements by UCAR or information provided on UCAR's website because that does not form part of the planning application. Um, and just so you're aware, there's no reference at all to hydrogen and hydrogen in the planning statements submitted by the applicant. So the need case that so, so the need conclusions um, the officers have come to 
and it's not, it's not taking the issue of um, high, high, you know, gas being used to produce hydrogen into account. Um, the issue about um, bringing investment into the local economy um, in terms of need, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, th- I mean, the, I, think, I think the economic issue we look at, we look at in in, in, in a wider in a, in a wider context. But I think it's, you know, it, it, obviously you assume that um, the development in a local area is going to have some knock-on benefits um, for the local community because 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 you're going to be, you're going to be supporting some local jobs. Um, what, when I say local, um, I'm, I'm not necessarily saying you know, within the local area. It, it, it could be within Surrey. Um, and the um, the condition. Um, so, you have the applicant um, submitted a final statement um, in August, trying to address some of the um, concerns and um, sort of raised in discussions at committee back on the 29th of June and they suggested um, eight, eight new or amended planning conditions. One, one of the new conditions they um, suggested, and it's, it's covered in full of the addendum officer report, um, is a condition on local procurement and local economic growth. Um, it's it's oft, officers have recommended that that condition is not included um, or, or imposed on the applicant. Um, but you know, also really minded by um, you know, paragraph 55 of the NPPF, which provides advice on planning conditions. Um, it says that they should be kept to a minimum, only imposed when they are necessary, relevant to planning, to the to the to, to the development permitted, enforceable, enforceable, precise, and reasonable in all other respects. Um, so. Um, I, mean, I mean, the view of offices is that condition is not necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms. Um, so, we, so, so we don't think we don't think we, we, we don't think it would be justified imposing that on the applicant. Um, I mean, so you know, it's, it's a point that could be challenged. So offices, offices, offices are not going to, not going to uh, recommend that, that that condition be be included. Um, local businesses, um, Councillor Muir um, mentioned the impact, the, the financial impact in particular on, on, on local businesses. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been, I mean, the impact has been assessed in, in depth, hasn't it, in, in the officer reports, um, and it's more you know, financial, financial impact is, is not so much a planning consideration. It's more, it's more the immediate, it's, it's more, it's more immediate impacts. Um, you, we are required to take the impact on local businesses into account. But um, um, we focus more on, on, on sensitive receptors. So it's the um, it's, 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 it's the residences, the dwelling houses, the houses the abode where people, where people live. Um, the applicant we have in, the, the applicant. Well, you, you hear the applicant um, today um, say that they would cease operations when the um, Drew Fields Cancer Festival is taking place. Um, we already know when it's scheduled to take place in, in July next year. It's one, it's one, it, it's one weekend. Um, the applicants are aware. I've informed the applicant of that. The applicants are aware of it. Um, they, they said they'll avoid that. It's not to to ensure that there's no impacts on that festival. So I don't, I don't see any reason why that, that festival has to close. And the applicants also committed to. Um, um, in short, in short operations in years two and three don't affect, do, do, do not affect that festival either. Um, in terms of the actual, um, in terms of the report, um, we have an informative that requires um, the applicant to be to liaise with um, local businesses and, and local residents to ensure the impacts are, 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 are minimised or, or kept or kept to an acceptable level. Okay, that, but we will move on to another set of speakers. Mm. Thank you. Right, um, we have Penny Rivers, Rose Thorne, and Stephen Cooksey. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, existing local businesses in that area are already challenged by COVID 19, 
And I think this might well adversely impact them even more. And to my mind, their immunities will be, or their, their general immunity is adversely impacted. Uh, I thought both Ashley Herman and Tom Gordon spoke very strongly about this. And to my mind, that is something we should give great consideration to. Sorry. Sorry, did you say me, Chairman? I did. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, uh, just one point. Um, Ashley from UCOG said that um, there would be no disruption to the to the wedding venue or to the the cancer um, research place. At weekends, he will. They will stop at one o'clock Fridays until Monday. But then, somebody else has said that they will be finishing at one o'clock on Fridays and one o'clock on Saturdays. So, um, I'm not sure which one uh, is is the right one. Um, yeah, that that's my question. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Ward is actually the part, but we will get the clarification for you. Stephen Cooksey. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think that um, the, the need aspect is a very significant aspect so far as this discussion is concerned. Um, and the latest government policy, um, the, the 10 points, um, the 10 point industrial, green industrial revolution, um, makes very very little or no reference to fossil fuel development um, and therefore one has the impression that, that it's becoming less and less important so far as the government's concerned. The only relationship I think between that 10 point plan and this application is the potential for producing low carbon hydrogen and my question therefore is how far advanced is the technology that would permit the conversion of the gas that's produced from this well into low carbon and hydrogen. Tim Evans and then Bernie Muir for Keith Taylor. Thank you. I just wanted to, to respond to the officer's comments on my comment. I'm not denying that great weight should be given to the benefit of extraction or whatever in the NPPF. What I'm trying to establish is how much benefit there is. Uh, what, it, what to me is, is not, um, there's a whole bunch of reasons that other people have said as to the, the, the effect it will have on the surrounding community and whether that's good or bad, and you can debate. But what I can't work out is what benefit there is in terms of how much gas could possibly be generated and what what value that would have to the world at large or, or, or the UK in particular. And there, there are very few numbers. It's all very, very um, uh, imprecise with regard to that. And as you know, Chairman, in, in, my, in another capacity, I'm Chairman of the Surrey Pension Fund. If an investment were to come to me that had as, uh, as little supporting evidence in terms of the numbers, as speculative as this is, I don't think I would be putting the pension funds money into it. So that's what I'm trying to do is to clarify more numbers. I don't think the case has been made that there's a great benefit coming out of this. Thank you. I heard my question. I'm not quite sure where the microphone is. Um, so um, I don't think that um, it's a very satisfactory answer, to be honest, to say one can, must assume that some jobs will come along with this versus actual jobs that actually exist. And there's a high likelihood that if, um, you know, their, um, the, bis the, the, the uh, events business uh, opportunities aren't blighted by, you know, the arrival of um, this, this, this um, very visible very visible edifices that come along with the UCOG um, proposition um, that this business will expand and they want to expand and expand significantly and create a huge vast variety of new jobs and that is set off against assuming that there may be some jobs um, associated with, with this 
um, I don't think one can one can operate on that basis. Um, the other the other um, side of this is um, uh, the, the applicant said something like, uh, oh no, the the owner of the land said something like he goes to a sports club down the road that has a load, of, you know, he can have a pint of beer and it's right next door to another oil well. Well, you know. The I don't suppose a sports club USP and business identity and actually being able to charge vast fortunes for that beer is based on it's affected either way, whether they have an oil ring next to it or not. Whereas a high end uh, establishment employing high end skills and creating vast array of jobs does depend on its surroundings and what can be seen um, and experienced from um from their venue, so I, I, I you know, I, I think my my concern is that I do believe in this instance, and bear in mind I have voted for most oil. Uh, I think all of the things that have come through since I've been on on the on the planning committee. I am concerned about this because I think the local economy in this case should be important, and I'm getting the idea that um, the officers are suggesting that. This isn't important, and that all that is important is the extraction. Well, I think I think in this instance the economy is important to this area, and especially now, you know, post COVID, and also post COVID, we've now changed to agile working, and to the 15 minute neighbourhood, where timetables and work timetables are going to change. And I've established from many event organisers that they are now already getting many more applications for midweek weddings and what such like, because people can take time out in the week to go to a wedding and catch up. They're working from home and timetables have changed. And so now they are getting vast numbers of applications for midweek, daytime, afternoon, evening, business and wedding situations. So I think there is a there is a material impact, and that when you actually look at the details of what they are likely to do with this transport arrangements and the management plan, it's all very if this if that they're not being held to anything by the conditions that we asked that might actually tie that operation into the operations of the of, of, of the Billingshurst farm. So none of those protections are there, and I think the likelihood is. That, that, you know, when you talk about worst case scenario in terms of business uh, movements and what have you, but I think this have, will have changed and that the, the likelihood is there have enormous numbers of applications for mid-week weddings and therefore whatever's regarded here is, is, is actually not likely to be, be relevant to the events management of the future and it does create huge amounts of jobs and a vast amount of money and I don't think it can be a place that's anything other than right at the top of the agenda for this particular area. I think you could make that point very clearly. Uh, Keith Taylor. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. If, uh, can I a bit of guidance, sort of, if I'm, unless I misheard you, you were wanting in this first phase to take um, questions in relation to the um, uh, environment and need. And, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the main point I was wanting to make in relation to this debate is relates more specifically to the local environment rather than uh, the wider issues of climate change and so on. Are you happy for me to sort of make my remarks at this stage? You could hold your remarks. For a second, we'll get to that in a minute. Rose? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I hate to be uh, whatever it is when you throw a wet blanket over things, but most of what other councillors have spoken about have got absolutely nothing to do with planning laws. I mean, yes, it would be nice if everybody got a job out of this, but we can't... Um, hold that against the company because it's not part of, of planning mix. It is. Any particular answers for anything you need to answer? I think on that point I'll say that's a no. We'll move to climate change. Oh, there are. Oh, there are. <laughs> 
Um, clarification on the um, on, on well site finishing times. Um, so on Friday, um, HGV movements would stop at 1 p.m. So there'd be no HGV move, movements after 1 p.m. on a Friday. Um, the, the same same on a Saturday. No HG, no HGV movements on Saturday after uh, after 1 p.m. Um, operational hours for the site also end at 1 p.m. on a Saturday. But on a Friday, operations can continue um, throughout throughout the day on, on a on a on a Friday. Um, it's um, site operations is at 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Aren't they? Um, I'm asking you. I should be. I should be, tell, I should be answering you. Um, yeah, um, Councillor Cook's his point about the um, you know the, the government's recent announcement on the on the ten point plan. Um, I mean, government um, you know, policy on, on, on need energy it, it, it's, it's, it's about supporting the transition to a, to a low carbon economy, isn't it? And, um, and and the point is, you can't turn the lights out overnight. So there's a gradual transition from um, you know, fossil, the use of fossil fuel fuels to produce energy to to renewable to, to renewables. Um, and the government policy, energy policy, recognises that we still need um, oil and gas um, into the into the future. Um, it's also the government's also concerned about having a mix of different different energy uses and and, and keeping the price down um, as part of its approach. Um, so it, 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 it almost comes it, it, it sort of gets tied tied with the climate change agenda, doesn't it? Which we get we get we might get onto next, but. Um, um, right. I think at that point we'll move rapidly onto the climate change agenda. That's all right, unless there's anything particularly new. There's, sorry, there's a bit of confusion, possibly, by so, sorry, uh, Councillor Evans, your point about gas volumes. Um, I, think, I think I said in my, my, my presentation at the start of the introduction that um, the purpose of the application is for ex exploration and appraisal. So, so the purpose is to ascertain how much gas or, or oil is actually there in the ground. Uh, you, the, 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 you know, the application is, uh, as submitted you know, um, is for exploration and appraisal, not production. So, so, so the assessment is based on, we don't know how much is there, and the only way you're going to find out is, is, is through this process. Um, otherwise, uh, otherwise, logic says you go straight to production, but you can't do that unless you know how much is there, uh, the quality of the hydrocarbon in the ground, and whether, it, and whether, whether that hydrocarbon can be commercially exploited. Move on to climate change. Stephen, sorry. Stephen, did you have a question? Tim Evans, sorry. Chen, I, I just wanted to check whether the, the question I asked earlier about need actually came through because I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure whether I was muted at the time. I think we got your question, yes. Okay, thank, thank you, Tim. I'll put my hand down there. Right. Now back to Tim. Sorry. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm sorry to keep coming back on this point, but I, I do understand what David is saying, is that you can't, you can't know how much is there till you, till you, till you've had a look. But a, a large amount of the uh, information that I've been receiving that has come through from people who have been querying all this has suggested that there are other ways of doing this without drilling a hole in the ground. And they're also suggesting that the mapping that is being used is incorrect. Now, I don't know whether those things are true or not. But what I'm saying is I, I would like to have some clarification and a much better supporting case that says we really expect that this amount, of, this amount of gas is going to be there and we can back it up with proper evidence. What I'm seeing at the moment it does not suggest that. I don't know whether Dr. Seaboard and all the other people are right or wrong. But it's very, very um, contentious within the planning report that is there. And what we're doing, it seems to me, if we pass this planning application, is giving is giving UCOG the chance to just dig a hole in the ground and have a look. Uh, and I'm not sure. I know they've got to, in the end, to do that if there's going to be anything there. But, but they can find out in other ways before they dig the hole in the ground. I don't think the case is being made for that particular aspect of it. And it seems to me to be fundamental, because if that's not true, everything else becomes subsidiary. 
Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Evans. Um, two points. Um, I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of confusion there because it's, it's obviously this is a very controversial application, um, and, um, and and the danger is, uh, as we have as we have been, we're getting into issues that do not form part of the planning application as submitted. And the information that you've been getting, it sounds like it's been information on gas volumes that either you can't have, uh, 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 have made themselves in statements which are not part of the application, um, mapping the issue that, you, that yourself and, and, Do and Dr. Seaborn referred to in his representation, nothing to do with the application as, as submitted. Um, uh, and as somebody can tell me differently, I, I've, seen no reference, I've seen no reference to that. Um, what, we're, what we're talking about is, is the development of an acceptable use of the land. Uh, you know, is, is, uh, at the end of the day, um, government policy supports hydrocarbon exploration and appraisal. It recognises that there are three stages to oil and gas development, exploration, appraisal and production, and, and, you, need separate, and, you, and you, know, the, you need separate planning permission. So it, it's perfectly logical in terms of government policy and um, the, the approach where you, you, you apply for permission for exploration and appraisal and to find out how much, how, if, if any hydrocarbons are present, how much is in the ground, the quality of that, of that mineral, whether, whether or not it can, can be commercially exploited or not. Or not. Um, to, to assess the application, we don't need to know, we, do, we don't require any estimates of how much gas or oil is in the ground up front. Um, we, don't, we, we don't need that. Um, you, what we're looking at is the use of the land to explore and, and appraise oil and gas except, acceptable in land use plan, in land use plan, planning terms. Um, I just want to come back to a point that Councillor Muir made about wedding venues increase, oh, sorry, wedding events increasingly taking place on, on a Wednesday. Um, on, on, on a weekday. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, think, I think the point is, is um, we can only really, we've only assessed the information sort of before us. In, 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 in accordance with the development plan and, and, and government policy, um, is, is the, um, the, the local resident um, who um, spoke earlier, uh, Mr. Gordon, who hosts the, uh, work, the wedding venue, and he's written into us on numerous occasions, um, pointing out a number of concerns. Uh, but he's never mentioned the point about um, weddings taking place in the week, so we've not really, you know, I haven't taken that into account. Um, and his, his planning application to increase the number of events at the venue from 30 to 50, I believe it was in, I think it got approved in March, um, and the transport statement that got submitted alongside that, and it was based on Saturday being the busiest day, which was a terms of transport movements, um, and, and so, so, you know, which was obviously when the roads are quieter. Um, so um, it's... It, it, you know, if that's the point that's being made, then, then obviously that, that, should, that, you know, that could change things. In terms of the assessments, in terms of the assessments we've done before, you know, does that still stand up? You know, you know and, um, and if, if more events are, are taking place in the week, um, but you know, the residents has, no, has never mentioned that to us, and I, I thought he would have done if that, that was an issue. We now have three more speakers. Penny, Penny Rivers, Keith Taylor, everybody here. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'm no scientist, but I think we can all see that climate change is happening and um, many councils have declared climate emergencies. I think it was the speaker, Chris Britton, I may be wrong, but I think it was Chris Britton who introduced a very important word into this morning's um, subject, and that word is children. They're missing from that long list of objectors, but I think we should uh, think about them. Keith Taylor. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to speak really about the um, impact of this development on the local environment, but inevitably that also in, uh, uh, some of the same points relate to this impact on local businesses and so on, which we already an area we've already strayed into. Perhaps I can make my remarks at, the, at this stage and uh, we will cover both categories. Uh, 
I mean, like other members, I'm sure, I've made a very determined attempt to read as many as possible of the, the very large number of resident letters and so on that we've um, uh, had. And um, uh, having done so, I, I have to say, I suspect the impression, uh, the impression of most of those local residents so, uh, about what an oil and gas extraction site um, actually looks like is based on the sort of the, the sort of images that we all, from time to time, see on TV or other or other media and um, uh, I think it's fair to say that um, almost inevitably such sites are sort of shown as being sort of industrial wastelands full of nodding donkeys and so on the sort of thing you find in in Texas or whatever and and if if people are under the imp impression that that's the sort of thing that we're going to be developing here and uh, is going to happen on their doorstep then I can thoroughly understand and sympathize with the, the very strong views that they um, argue in, uh, in their letters, particularly letters of objection. But, and there's a very important but, you don't need to go as far as Texas to get a, a more balanced view of what a modern, properly managed extraction site actually looks like. Um, there are quite a number of them already around in southern England, and even, uh, even in a few in, uh, in Surrey. And, and I can speak with some knowledge on this, um, not because I have any links with the oil and gas industry, but because I uh, happen to be one of the few county councillors who, council, who has a, uh, a working sort of gas extraction site actually in my own division, and that's in the village of Albury, which is only about 10 miles away from, from Dunstall. Um, uh, some longer serving colleagues on the committee will recall uh, having visited the Albury site um, and will confirm that it's actually quite difficult to find. Um, it is accessed by a, a minor D-class country road and then along a, a, a forest trail that is also um, used by vehicles including HGVs in, in connection with um, uh, commercial forestry. If you drive a short distance along that trail, you get to a clearing on your left-hand side, as about as large as a tennis court, and there's a security fence around the, ten uh, the, the clearing, and in the middle of it, there was a small cabinet of equipment, not much bigger than the, uh, a service station petrol pump. And that is all that you can see on the site. All the gas from the site so goes by a local pipeline directly into the main national gas network, the only vehicle movement to and from the site are by smaller vehicles, vans and so on, by um, security and maintenance employees making occasional visits. If you talk to all the rest of residents, you'll find that many of them do not even know that there is a gas extraction site near, near them, but those who, who are aware of it, um, by and large, will tell you that they're not, they're not affected by it in any way. Having been the local councillor for 12 years, I, I recall that there have been um, two um, uh, relatively short periods of more intensive activity on the site. One for the exploration phase, with the equivalent of what we're looking at now, and then one to actually gear it up for, uh, for full production. During both periods, heavy drilling equipment was taken to the site by HGVs, used for a few weeks, and then taken away again. However, the local residents were quite used to seeing HGVs going into and out of this, um, this particular track in connection with commercial forestry. Uh, and uh, I hardly noticed that the relatively few extra HGV movements that occurred in this period. As, as a local councillor, I can honestly say that I'm not recall any, receiving any complaints from local residents at the, at the time about this. About I can only uh, uh, repeat that I understand and am fully sympathetic with the very strong concerns expressed by Dunstall residents and local organisations. However, for reasons that I've explained, I, uh, I fear that their concerns are based on a serious misapprehension of what are actually uh, a, a modern, well-managed uh, oil or gas exploration site actually looks like. That's really what I wanted to say, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. It's helpful, as you say. For those of us who've sat at the for any time and have been around various sites in Surrey, they are quite small and they are quite discreet. They don't quite match some of the images people may have. Uh, Andrew Clovey, then Bernie Neal.
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think it's quite wrong to compare this a application to an existing uh, production site. What we're talking about here is an exploration um, with a 37 meter tower uh, in an area of great landscape value. I, I can't think of anything more ridiculous, to be quite honest. Um, you will recall that there was um, a video produced for the original planning application, which initially showed uh, an impression of the tower and what it would look like. Now, mysteriously, that part of the video disappeared, but we never uh, got an explanation for that. But it clearly illustrated the enormous impact of this 37 meter tower on the landscape in this most beautiful part of Surrey with the views from Hascombe Hill and, and it would just be right in the middle of that view. And I can't think of anything worse when we've got this designation of an area of great landscape value to put a 37 metre oil rig in it. It just belies all common sense or, or you know, belief, I think, in, in members of the public. And that's what we've heard from the local people. In terms of planning policy, in 2010, um, as leader of the council, I agreed with Roger Hargreaves, the then chief planning officer, and it was put through that the AGLV would be treated in Surrey policy terms in the same way as the AOMB. Now, I'm not aware that that policy has ever been changed. And in fact, from what uh, various speakers said, it sounds as if it was actually incorporated into Waverley's uh, policy, uh, as they seem to be saying exactly the same thing. So uh, I would like some comments from officers on both the alteration to the video and uh, the question of policy around the AGLV. Thank you. Bernie, Mia? Yeah, uh, first of all, actually, I'd like to address what um, Councillor Taylor said. Um, you mentioned about the Albury site, but I'm not quite sure what the relevance of that is to this, because one, you say it's extremely difficult to find. It's down a D-class road, down a forest path, and that the extraction is uh, taken away by pipeline. Well, none of that is relevant to this particular um, development. Um, and in fact, the 30 is a very good segue here between the two comments between um, Keith, um, Councillor Taylor and Povey as to what I was going to say, because quite to the contrary, this has a 37 metre tower directly in front of a, a local business, which, in you know, the amenity to that business, if you like, uh, is taken away. Um, so I, I, I think this is an entirely different proposition. But I, what I do want to establish is to follow up what Councillor Thorne said. My understanding is that um, an impact to community employment, etc., is a consideration in terms of planning. Uh, I believe that it is. Um, and I believe that uh, one has to look very closely. And that is the one element of all these papers that I, I do not see is that there isn't the articulation in the annex or in any of the papers as to the nature and input that those businesses actually have to the local community. And from everything that has been said in the last meeting in this, it is very, very clear that they have a significant and growing impact on the community. And by the way, weekday, venue, weekday weddings are mentioned in the last papers and this and in the last submission of the, the previous submission of the um, of the owner of that business. And um, and my I, I stand by the points that I say, and I think any responsible um, any, uh, consideration should be taken to the current current situation, which precedes presumably the production of the information regarding that business. So I'd like to information on the economy aspect of this planning application. 
Right. Would officers like to answer those points? So, um, yeah, um, the point about we need to think about chill children, um, I, I'm assuming you're referring to climate change, I'm not sure I've probably quite got on to that is, is, issue yet, so I might park that for now until unless a particular question comes back. Um, Councillor Taylor's points, um, sort of note those. Councillor Homey, um, AGLV and the RIG, and um, you consider, obviously, the consideration that it's, it's a ridiculous um, place to start to, 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 to cite an, an oil well. Um, I think you have to think. Uh, you, you, you have to think about it in terms of um, minerals can only be worked where they are found. Um, my co-presentation earlier did, 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 did explain the applicants done a site search of 23 sites, trying to find a site with the least environmental, the, the, the lowest impact on the environment and the local community. Um, and and it, 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 you know, it's part, part of the application. If you read that, it's, it, it, it's, it's quite well and logically put together, um, I thought. And, and, and reasonably well justified. And, 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 and well justified. Um, remember, um, the ground-based development um, is, is, is screened um, quite significantly by the topography, which I referred to in quite some detail when I was going through the presentation slides earlier, and also the, the mitigation measures um, provided by the applicant, which are detailed in the, is detailed in the officer report, um, primarily in terms of screening. Um, the application itself, it's temporary for three years, as we know. Um, don't fall into the trap of thinking the rig or the crane is going to be, will be on site for three years, um, because that, that is not the case. The application explains, if, if, if you look at it, that I think overall the rig, or, the rig or crane will be on site for a maximum of 35 weeks um, during that three-year period. So that's 35 weeks. Um, most of that obviously is to do with the drilling. Um, and, and, and the drilling is worse. It's based, the drilling is based on a worst-case scenario. It's the drilling is 12 weeks per well, you know, the main well and the side track well. The applicant says in, in, in the submission that they may not need to side track the well. So, but, but, but obviously we assess the application on the worst case. Um, the 12 weeks drilling per well it, it, it is a worst case. Um, the applicants. It's, it's mentioned, it mentioned that some um, example at Horse Hill, where I believe they both they, they drilled the two wells in under 10 weeks. I, I, I seem to recall. Um, so under 10 weeks as opposed to 24 weeks, but 24 weeks as a worst case. So um, you've, you've got so the, the rig of the crane. Obviously, you can the lower parts can be screened, but obviously you, can, you can't screen the upper parts from from certain viewpoints. You you, you have to bear in mind. The, uh, the screening around the site in terms of existing trees that, that are there, um, trees up to 16 metres along the northern boundary, which, will, which will, will remain in place because they are within the applicant's control. Um, trees more sporadic, but there is screening um, on the boundary between High Billingshurst Farm and the well site host field. Um, not a case that you've got clear views of the uh, drilling rig from, from High Billingshurst Farm. Um, the representation from High Billingshurst Farm included a photograph showing an event taking place outdoors with seating all laid out pointing, to, um, pointing directly towards Haskham Hill to make the most, most of that view. Um, if you assess that image, the rig is over to the right, over to the right hand side, which is over to the east. Or, or it is not directly in, the, in that field of view. And depending, and depending, on, where you, and depending on where you're sitting, there are, there are trees there as well. And remember, the events, the, the events, are set, the events take place you know, in a building, um, which is um, further away from the application site than the actual uh, the main residence. Not a lot, but it's a bit further away. The main residence is 390 metres away from the centre of the well site. So you have to think of these mitigation mitigating circumstances um, held in detail, very thoroughly, in the officer report to 29th of June committee when you consider the landscape impact of, of, of the application. Um, point about the Waverley Borough, uh, so point about the County Council HLV AONB policy. Um, so uh, when, when you were leader, um, you, 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 think you had a policy which the County Council adopted, which meant the, we would treat the HLV the same as the AONB until the review was completed. Um, you, have, you, have, you, have, you have to think about 
how in planning terms, um, planning decisions that were, were, were required legally of the Titanic Country Planning Act to make decisions primarily in accordance with the development plan and, and, and any other material considerations. Um, most important material considerations arguably would be government national planning policy contained in the NPPF. Um, the amount of weight you give to a uh, county council policy compared to the development plan would be a lot, would have to be a lot more limited. Um, as, a, as a matter of logic, um, the way to move that, po- to, the, the way to move the county council policy forward in terms of get, getting it more weight would be through discussions at the plan making stage with the minerals and waste policy team and, and getting that policy in the actual minerals plan itself. Um, but obviously, obviously that plan is is subject to independent examination, so so uh, and it's, it's, it's thoroughly tested before it's adopted. So um, you know, there'd the, the, the be a hurdle to climb, but um, that you can't give that the same weight as it, you can't give that county council policy the same weight as, as you give to development plan policy or or government planning policy, the NPPF. Um, and the Waverley Borough Local Plan, um, yes, um, uh, the, the point the point you make you make is correct. Um, my only response to that would be that is, is that obviously the Surrey Minerals Plan is specifically designed to uh, assess the impact of minerals development. Yeah, uh, minerals can only be worked where they are found, of course, and the way the Borough Local Plan is obviously does not take into account um, it, you know, the, the policies aren't based on the need to, for them to be used to determine min- applications for minerals development, where there, where there are limitations over where um, minerals can be extracted. Minerals can be extracted. Um, but final comment, I'll just say that obviously with oil and gas, there's, there's a small margin of error in terms of minerals going to be worked where they're found because you can directionally drill. And I think that ex- probably extends, extends the, the possible search area for sites by, I think it's about a kilometre from, from, from memory. Um, so it's a little bit wider, but not significantly greater, greater area. Um, I've addressed Councillor Muir's point about the tower being directly in front of the local business. The business. Um, I, 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 I just make the point in terms of from Thatched House Farm, those trees that will, that will be retained um, will, will screen a, a higher portion of the tower um, from, from, from most vantage points. Um, probably not, probably not the very top section necessarily. Um, um, I want to say screen, um, I mean, I, mean, I should say partially screen or filter, because you know, I, I do appreciate that in the winter time, um, when trees lose their leaves, um, you, you, there, there, be, there, there, there would be less screening in place. And Councillor Muir, you've raised the point again about the local community. Um, it, 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 and... Um, Local businesses and finance. This is, this is all on the subject of the need argument. Um, I mean, in the need argument, and the reasons why councillors are very, um, so why officers are, 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 you know, very, are, are very strongly feel that the, the need for the application has been justified. Um, it's spelled out in detail in the, in the, in the officer report. I think I've summarised it in the addendum report in paragraph 25. Um, you know, we said that we know there's been no change in government policy in relation to the great weight that should be given to, to the benefits of mineral extraction to the economy. The mineral resources make an essential contribution to the country's pros- prosperity and quality of life. The need for energy minerals, sorry, the need for energy supplies to come from a variety of sources, including oil and gas. This is all government and energy policy, by the way. The promotion and use of domestic gas resources to the maximum extent to support the transition to a low carbon economy and provide, providing a balanced approach towards securing a reduction in, in energy consumption through the husbanding of domestic uh, supplies to both reduce reliance on imports and cont- contribute to energy security. Um, benefits to local economy and local business better. It is a need to have to be seen in, in, that, in, that, in that broader context. Um, but that's the answer to that question. Thank you. I think at that point we will have another break for... Uh, just under, under 10 minutes, we will come back at 12.50. That's everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Who are we live? Yes, we are. Uh, 
Right. On that basis, Bernie, you're next. Uh, when I was uh, looking at this, um, I was to have a bit of a drive around and I sort of I googled the businesses, etc., to see what I could find. And I just wanted to correct one of the things that the officer mentioned about the events business. He said that the events take place inside. Well, actually, they use both the inside or the outside or indeed the inside and the outside for events. Um, and therefore, when the outside events are directly um, impacted by what's going on there, as well as the inside events, as well as, you know, when you're taking people around um, to um, view a property, um, then obviously you walk around the property and, and decide, you know, what's, what you're going to be looking at. So I just wanted to correct that. And I, I'm sorry to bash on about this, but I'm still not clear. So I'd like uh, some clarity here. So I'm asking about how much weight we take in terms of the impact of the demise of a powerful local business. So you mentioned that, the, you know, the weighting, the government policy and what have you. But the ink, what it, are we allowed as councillors to put a full weight behind the impact in this instance and bear in mind I have voted for the other um, you know drilling propositions in this instance if we believe this is a huge detriment to employment and investment and prospects and indeed I you know I am you know we are aware of the, the sudden trend towards all year, all all year round, all week round, all day round events of this kind. Are we allowed to have that as a consideration in our outcome? Because the implication from your answer is, yes, it is a consideration, but actually it never really is a consideration because you've got to weigh the minerals policy. But if we believe this is a significant situation, are we allowed to take that into account in our final conclusion about the validity of this project or not? This is an application for oil exploration. It would involve a relatively small number of vehicle movements. It will involve a drilling rig and a crane for short periods of time. The local businesses will be impacted to a certain degree. I don't think it's reasonable to suggest that a business will fail on the basis of what is in front of us. The impact on the businesses needs to be taken into account, but it needs to be weighed against every other consideration in respect of this planning application. Um, I have no evidence in front of me to suggest that the proposal that we have to determine today is going to result in the businesses failing. Can I not back on that? I'm not entirely clear. I mean, you, I'm not entirely clear on what basis you're suggesting that the planning impacts of this proposal will cause them to fail. Right. Okay. Back on that. I think a lot of this moment. Oh. Yeah. Become a slightly circular conversation, and we maybe I think that might be difficult for everybody. Right. Tim Evans, Penny Rivers, and Yvonne Lay. I, am I, Go I, ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. My, my remarks are really connected to Councillor Muir's. I wrote, I've written down measurable benefit against local harm. Uh, I'm hearing in the reply to, to, um, to Councillor Muir that 
you can't really identify what the local harm is or how much it is. Neither, as far as I'm able to tell, can we work out what the measurable benefit is. And nobody seems to be prepared to even try to answer that question is how much gas we might get out of it and, how much, and what it's worth when we've got it. I'm told that somehow or other it doesn't matter. And it, 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 makes, it makes me wonder when I heard a remark made by one of the officers to the effect that the 23, did I get this right? 23 sites have been looked at before coming on this particular one. And I got the impression that this site was unique in the sense that everybody was, well, at least the applicant was, was absolutely certain that if they drilled here, they were going to find this particular seam on the basis of other sort of seismic exploration. But if there were 23 other sites, what happened to them? And can it really be that unique? It seems odd. And just as a passing remark, when I'm sort of on my feet, as it were, when it comes to screening, David did say, yes, it would be different in winter. And I was going to make the same point. I don't know how much leaf there is on the trees in, in, in December compared with uh, May when the pictures were taken. I wonder why we didn't get new pictures. There's been plenty of time for that. But I really care about this question about measurable benefit against local harm, because that seems to me to be the key to the whole application. Penny Rivers, Benny Bonnelay. Thank you very much. Well, my reading of policy MC14, it says that we should there should be no significant adverse impact arising from the development and to my mind, um, I haven't been shown that there is no insignificant or no significant adverse impact. I, I veer on the side that there might be. We don't have proof because it hasn't happened. We're judging this ahead of time. But my feeling is that we have been shown that there may well be significant adverse impact arising from this development. Thank you. Right. Could I remind members to please keep your cameras on? Um, Yvonne Ale. Yvonne. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can I just challenge the officer when she said that she couldn't see any real impact to the wedding business? I mean, I'd like to know when she last went to a wedding, because I've just done two for my daughter and my son. My last one cost me £54,000. And if I couldn't have had photographs taken outside of the venue, then I wouldn't have been there. And if I'd have gone to look around like I did and seen this massive tower and what was going on locally, I certainly wouldn't have picked that venue. Also, we do have to be mindful of COVID-19. This, this business has probably not done anything for the last 12 months. All the weddings would have been put forward onto 2021 and they will be going probably full blast six to seven days a week and to say that this is going to finish at one o'clock on a Friday and one o'clock on a Saturday is suffice I'm sorry I really don't see it and if you want some policies I've got lots of them um, with regards to all the local businesses but I think I'll stop there. I think you've made your point. Andrew Covey. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Well, I'm going to make the same points as, as the two previous speakers that, uh, you know, there, there should have been a proper assessment of the impact. Uh, that's one. Uh, and yes, I have similar experience to Yvonne Le with my children. This is a very competitive market. People are willing to spend large amounts of money on wedding events, but they really do want something good, not something next to an oil well. Right. Um, at that point, we have environment and tra any other environmental transport issues is the next visit. We'll wind up from there. Just so. Any other questions on environmental and transport issues which haven't already been raised? Andrew. And then Bernie. Andrew? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Well, um, I'm afraid I, I'm still uh, very unconvinced regarding the highways uh, aspect. Um, this is a road that from the A281 has four right angle bends, uh, is signposted as um, unsuitable for HGVs. Uh, and if officers are saying there, are, I think they said 775 
lorries a day are going along a road that is unsuitable for HUVs. I think rather than saying, well, a few more won't matter, I'd be saying, what on earth's going on here? You know, why is everybody just, you know, taking no notice of the unsuitable for HGVs? And I'd want to investigate why they are going that way. So I, I think uh, the road, you know, for those of us who know it and those of us who drive it regularly, it is a very dangerous road. There have been a whole series of accidents on these corners. That's why it has the special surface on it. And the fact that, OK, so far, none of the accidents have actually involved in a HGV. I say, well, thank goodness for that, because I suspect the result of the accident would have been a lot worse if they had. But I don't believe that's an argument for saying it's safe for HGVs just because they have in themselves haven't been part of the many accidents that have occurred. Um, we also have uh, a clear push at the moment, both nationally uh, and in the council, for walking and cycling. Well, there's no path and there's no cycle way on this road whatsoever. So, you know, in terms of road safety, and again, just looking a little bit to the future with an increase in walking and cycling, again, I have to say this is not a road where you want to encourage uh, HGVs uh, along it. It's not safe. It's not a suitable road for HGVs in any sense whatsoever. Uh, and, and not only that, the routing apparently then would be along the 281. Well, again, for those of us who know the 281 and all the poor people in Bramley who have to suffer the HGVs going up the high street, another thousand lorries a year going up Bramley High Street, I don't think is what people uh, are looking for. And I don't think it's reasonable. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Bernie. Sorry. Okay, so um, there are a few things that I find rather vague, and therefore, if they're vague, mean they can't be tied down from the point of view of the people who are likely to be affected. Uh, in point two seven three, uh, which is on page one one one, it says outside these periods on the days when scheduled vehicles are able to access the site without using the traffic signal. These can be removed. Now, at what level, at what moment? And, and this, this sort of phraseology at not peak time, at not this, if, if we deem that it's, it's, uh, you know, a, a low level activity or whatever, if it, it features here, how, uh, you know, where, at what point do residents, uh, are residents able to say, well, actually, we sat through that meeting, we know that conditions were, you know, were, were set that, in these circumstances, um, banksmen or, or, or lights have to go up, but it, it's actually not quantified anywhere. So if they deem the activity to be low or not necessary, then they don't have to do it. And so uh, that happens on point 273. And again, um, in, in uh, point 279, and, and then on 283, it says, uh, where, uh, it's page 112, uh, where proposed HG movements are lower, access and egress to the site could be facilitated through the use of banksmen. And then it goes on to make a number of points, none of which are are clear or defined. Uh, and then it goes on to um, uh, aspects. Of, um, well, actually, let's just, let's just confine ourselves to those. How can they quantify when traffic lights and banksmen are to be used? Because if we don't nail it to some minimum level then it's very difficult for residents to come back and say well that doesn't conform to what we sat through and what we agreed um at, at the planning application meeting um and, and actually when it comes to these sorts of assurities and safeguards that residents are supposed to take on there's almost no quanti quantification at all it's it's basically up to the operator to decide if it's reached that level or not Right, well, let's, we've got Andy Stokes of Transport Development Control on the line. So on that basis, I think it's a pretty good place to call Andy and ask for your contribution. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, if I can, I'll pick up on those those points that have just been made. Um, I think, firstly, just picking up on um, Councillor Muir's comments um, in terms of when traffic signals are going to be used versus uh, banksmen. Um, the I think that I'm not going to give you an answer that perhaps gives you the definition that you require, sadly. Um, but what I would say is in, in discussion with our traffic signals um, teams, with our road safety teams, with our street works teams, there is a desire um, for the use of traffic signals there to be uh, minimised, um, not to be um, overly used. Um, because of the uh, inherent you know, uh, impact that that would have on the throughput of traffic on, on that road. Um, but it is essential that the traffic signals are used when, when it is required. Um, so those, those details as to when the traffic signals will be required versus banksmen will be something that comes out of the um, construction transport um, construction management plan. So sadly, I can't give you the answer that you're looking for in terms of a, a, def a definitive cutoff point because largely that is something that will come out of the construction management plan. Can we come back on that? Absolutely. Um, it also, how involved would the events business be in you know, supplying data about their forthcoming events or setups and, and all the rest of it? How involved would they be in when banksmen and traffic lights might be used in nature of, of conflict with their business as we are, you know, obviously the if they have business uh, events going on during the week, um, they are going to be part of that traffic creation. No, indeed, I understand that. Um, that there's there's a requirement within the construction and transport management plan condition um, that requires um, the um, how can I put it the liaison, if you like, or consultation with uh, High, High Billinghurst Farm, which is obviously the events company. Um, to discuss with them to in order, uh, how can I put this, so that they can put in place measures which best accommodate the, the cumulative impact of both the event traffic and the uh, the application site traffic. So Sorry, I'll, 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 on that. it doesn't require, does it? It, it, well, advises, can I, it, it advises, it doesn't require. If, if I, would, it, would it be appropriate if I read the, the, the relevant paragraph from the from the condition um, where it says having consulted with High Billinghurst Farm the submission of traffic management measures by phase for the cumulative traffic flows generated by the development hereby permitted and High Billinghurst Farm during an event as defined by Waverley Borough Council decision notice and it gives the planning reference number uh, these measures shall be designed to minimize the use of traffic signals or optimize traffic signal operation in the interest of the free flow of traffic Within high within high Loxley Road, so the condition there is to is, is definitely puts an onus upon the applicant that in producing the traffic management plan, they have to consult with uh, High Boonsers Farm to understand what their needs are and what their flows are in order that they can best accommodate them in producing the the eventual traffic management plan solution. I think that's helpful. Stephen Cooksey, Stephen. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I don't want to take up very much time, but I do want to uh, to support the comments that Andrew made a, a few minutes ago. I've been very concerned um, when we discussed this in June about the, the traffic implications on roads, which appear to me to be quite unsuitable for the heavy vehicles that are intended to be put on them. And I think there are additional complications that haven't been looked at seriously, such as the, the developing traffic from the garden village as it's developed um, and the traffic from, from businesses, which I don't think has been balanced sensibly. Um, and it would uh, inevitably, of course, the, the condition for the traffic management plan comes after we've, after we've been asked to make a decision about the planning application. But it would have been really helpful to have had the traffic management plan um, ahead so that we can be we could be much more aware of the consequences. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, can I come back about the point about hey, Dunstall Road being unsuitable for yeah. HGVs and the signage? Um, I know that's a particular issue of Councillor Povey. Um, I don't think I'll convince him, but um, I'll try. Um, 
the agenda of the report um, deals with that um, point. Um, basically, says that Dunsfeld Road, from its junction with the A281 to to its junction uh, where, wherever it comes out, just just south of Godalming, um, that, that has signage saying the road is uh, is unsuitable for the HGVs. Um, CHA have clarified that it's not the whole road that's unsuitable for HGVs. In fact, they've, they've actually clarified the section between the A281 and High Luxury Road, or France Corner, is absolutely fine in terms of, for, for, for HGVs. It's, um, it's a section further to the north, uh, where, where, it goes, where, where it goes through some of, some of the villages, um, where, where, where there's concern about HGVs movement. So the application um, does not uh, it, 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 you know, it would involve no, no HGVs um, along, along, along a path that road that is not suitable. Um, the accidents on the bends that Council Home is concerned about, um, I think the point, the point he's making is that he's worried that um, there have, have, haven't been any good HGVs yet, but there might be, there might be in future. Um, The accidents are breaking hard, but not, but not breaking in time, and then and, and then and, 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 and then there's being involved in, in, a, in an accident. Um, HGVs, remember, are travelling at pretty low speed. So, in, so if you think about it logically, um, in what respect is an HGV likely to have an accident going go around a tight bend? Um, and, and again, um, uh, Council Povey picked pick, pick out the point about the number of HGVs already travelling along um, Dunstall Road. Well, uh, Every day, you look at that in the context of the application. We're talking about a maximum of 20 movements a day, and for a lot of, and for a significant portion of the three years, it'll be half. It'll be half that amount. Um, it's it's a minuscule amount of heavy goods vehicle movements. Um, it is absolutely net, net, the additional impact of HGVs traveling on Dunsfold Road is net, 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 negligible. I don't see how you could. I don't, I don't, I don't see how you can argue that point um, you know, from, 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 from a plan, plan, planning point of view. Right. Andy Stokes would like to contribute. Thank you. Andy? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I, I just wanted to build really upon what uh, David had just, just said. Um, having reviewed, you know, the suitability of that section of Dunsfold Road, you know, the key, the key indicators for us are whether there's been any HGV related accidents. Um, and I think as, as we can see there, there haven't been any. And then secondly, as a perhaps slightly more visible, um, um, inspection of the road, not, not detailed inspection, but detailed sort of observation of the road. Um, and having driven along that road, you know, I, I took close, took a close look at the, the edges of the road, whether there's any, um, evidence of HGVs overrunning the edges of the carriageway, damage to verges, that kind of thing, which would normally uh, signify on a rural road, um, you know, whether HGVs are struggling to use it or not. And I, I have to say, I couldn't find any significant evidence of HGVs or, or tyre tracks um, going beyond the normal highway uh, edges and onto the verges. So that combined with the uh, the lack of accident history has, has led us to believe that the road is is suitable at that point for HGV usage. Right, that's helpful. Um, Sarge? Yeah, I think Andrew Stokes kind of answered my question. What I was looking at, like a comment, is um, if this place is, if the road is unsuitable for HGVs, why haven't you placed any restrictions on it? You know, time to time again, we're hearing this, but surely there is a uh, process available that we can put restrictions on the on the highway if it's unsuitable for HGVs. Andy, do you want to? Yes, absolutely. So the, the signs that we have um, that are in place at the moment up by the, the Nathaz crossroads are advisory signs which advise uh, drivers that it's unsuitable for HGVs. And I think, as David has mentioned, our observation is that the section from uh, Nanho Crossroads down to the application site is is um, you know adequate in its in its general makeup and geometry for HGV usage. It's really the section that goes from the application site up towards Godalming that then presents more of a, an issue. Um, I believe the signage is there for historic for for historic reasons through concerns through the Waverley Local Committee because of uh, running traffic. 
um, some of which is perhaps brought about by um, uh, sat-nav systems, perhaps um, incorrectly routing uh, traffic away from the, the, the main roads. Um, so the signage at the moment is advisory. Um, if there were a greater concern, particularly over HGVs going through that route, then obviously you could back it up with uh, more, um, you know, with actual uh, HGV lorry bands, um, which can be used where there are environmental concerns. They can also be used where you've got physical weight limits, such as bridges, but they can be used where you have environmental concerns. That's not the situation here. The signage that we have here is uh, advisory to discourage that through routing of HGVs. Right. Well, that's helpful. I think at that point we will break for for a lunch break. I guess just until quarter to two, so one forty-five. Now, as everybody regroup a bit. Thank you very much. The excess dark. So go. Um, next speaker is Ernest. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I take it that we are can now speak generally. To yes, this. I think that's really a good idea, isn't it? Thank you. Uh, could I? I I'd like, just like to say to start, not, perhaps not specific to this application, but specific to everything that we deal with. Uh, this committee deals with a lot of infrastructure. In fact, it's its main purpose to deal with a lot of in infrastructure applications. And it is the case, of course, that these infrastructure projects are part of our Western society, which we wouldn't have a standard of living without. And consequently, the other aspect which applies is that they all have to be in a specific place. Uh, and particularly things like quarries and oil wells, you can't move them somewhere where the, where the resources which they're going to deal with are not located. So they are going to be in both rural and, uh, and also residential areas from time to time. Uh, nowhere in the country is exempt. You can see this from HS2. Um, it's affecting a lot of people, but basically it is an infrastructure project for the good of society, and I think this is what we're looking at here. And so I, I, that, having sort of said that, I'd like to deal with the specific objections. I've had uh, quite a lot of other members have, and a lot has been uh, made today by those who have spoken. The thrust of the objection seems to me to be either non-factual, non that is, it, it isn't correct in what is being said, or purely emotional in the sense that it's not really a planning issue, or if it is a planning issue, it's not something uh, which you can base a refusal on. You may be able to put a, an advice to the applicant on, but you can't actually rely on it uh, as a refusal. And, and the first situation that this concerns is the understanding of what this application is. This application is an application for uh, investigation, basically, and this is what the uh, law, the planning law requires. It requires planning for oil wells in particular to be in either two and sometimes three stages, but the first stage has to be uh, to prove explanation. So, what, so comments about whether the gas is actually there or the mineral is actually there as, are not, as somewhat irrelevant. The risk, when it's not there, is taken by the applicant. It's not taken by the council. If the, if the applicant, when he carries out the exploration, uh, doesn't find it, well, that's it. The, the thing shuts down and, and it goes away. Um, the other argument on, on this, of course, is the green argument uh, in terms of that it's not needed. First of all, it's not needed because we're not sure it's there. And now, it, then it's not needed because we're it really in the green environment now, and therefore this is totally against all green policies. But the fact is that oil and gas and, and mineral explanation is, isn't going to shut up as a demand by society uh, just because we've now got a green agenda. We've got a green agenda and that will come into being. Uh, but you can't shut off uh, your 
resources which you need either nationally or internationally because of that. Another argument which occurs on the need basis is this one which hasn't been voiced so far here today, but it's certainly been voiced in the objections which I have received, is the fact that there is a white paper coming up from the government on uh, climate change and all sorts of other things and uh, what, what, what the way forward in the future. That white paper has been delayed and delayed and there's nobody knows what's going to be in it anyway. And so we can't actually deal with this application on an objection to the fact that the white paper may say something different to what this planning application is concerned with. And then there's a there's a lot of, been a lot of discussion on housing, the Dunsfield housing. Now, I've been involved with that as previous chairman of housing for Elmbridge, which is not obviously in this area, but which obviously affects the housing in Surrey and the general supply. And this has been going on for at least 10 years. And of course, for most of that time, the population, particularly the population of Cranley and local, um, have been absolutely against, they absolutely against every argument, many of which we've heard today against this uh, particular application, have been levelled against this housing. Now today, apparently, uh, the fact that the housing is taking place and will continue to take place uh, is a big argument, apparently, for being against this. However, I would, on that particular point, I'd remind the committee that up and down the country, Mines and this kind of situation has happened all the time. If you go to Bath, the whole city is built on a vacuum underneath where all stones have been taken out. So it's not unusual, and of course you get this in the north of England, it's not at all unusual to have mines which run under property or and so on. Of course they can't run anywhere else. So I, I think the the notion that somehow or other that these houses which are being built at Dunsfield, Dunsfold will not be attractive or won't be sold or will have some great disadvantage on the surface and, and somehow or other will either be a failure or, or whatever. I'm not quite sure what the final uh, decision is supposed to be on them. But the fact is, Surrey is very short of housing. Um, our, any, anyone who's experienced on housing will know that houses sell almost before the roof is on and I really don't think that there is, could possibly be any effect on housing due to uh, somebody realising there's a uh, large drilling pipe or something uh, several hundred or thousand feet or whatever underneath uh, where they're going to live. Uh, and the next uh, next point, which has been sent to me in writing a lot, and we've heard a, very much of today, has been the effect on local business. Now, I've served on other planning committees than this one. It's not actually an absolute requirement of a planning application that it should not affect another business. I mean, we're all familiar with supermarkets muscling in on the high street and uh, ruining the high street, but you can't put that up as an as a objection to for somebody not building a bigger and better business than what's there before. But in any fact, fact, in any case, that being one premise, the other premise that's being put forward, which really disturbs me, is the absolute apparent belief, or well, almost verging on to being a fact, that the wedding business which has been developed, some sort of six million pounds worth of business or something like that, will somehow disappear. Now, there isn't any way that if somebody's got a business of this type in a rural area, in a pleasant location, if they can see an oil rig, uh, which they won't be able to see for very long anyway, but if they can see an oil rig which is about 400 metres away, uh, that they're somehow going to not be there, or the bulk of people who are called won't go there. I mean, certainly the, the, I, I would have to concede that People have got different views on life, and there'll be the odd person that might not wish to book if that was the case. But quite frankly, the, the thought that the business would close, I mean, I, I'd be willing to place a thousand pound bet down here and now that if this application gets uh, approved, that that business, that winning business 
once this is in being and, and starting or whatever, that business will actually be running as it is very much as it is now. And I, I think the whole idea that, that, that you're going to ruin a business 400 metres away in a pleasant that's already in a rural present environment by having an oil well that's largely behind trees some distance away isn't going to, there's not going to be noise or dust or anything flowing over anybody else from there. And I, I do not see that any relationship between that business having to close uh, in, in order to facilitate this business to be there. And uh, the, the other thing on businesses, we've also heard, of course, that there's a lot of other businesses in this area which are running, and they're mainly farming. Uh, one that hasn't been mentioned is that there is a, a potentially large logging business on the doorstep, which in itself will need heavy machinery when, in fact, any logging takes place. Um, and then, of course, we come to the landscape impact. Well, there will be, obviously, as it's been admitted, there's obviously, you can't build anything in this life uh, without some kind of impact on somebody. And, I mean, we, we ask to refer back to things like the HS2 and, and all sorts of other developments we all know in our own areas. I mean, my own area, I've had two of the largest quarries in Surrey. I've got, the, I've got one of the largest, uh, the second largest reservoir in Surrey, which was built in my lifetime. All of these things impinge locally, but they are infrastructure projects, which it has to be weighed. And in the end of the day, uh, the weight has to be on the national priority. We've heard also from the uh, farming community, as I mentioned. I mean, I'm from farming uh, stock myself. Uh, all my family are farmers. Uh, and I know that in this day and age that anybody having a, what's we, what in the trade is called a, a float, a, farm, a cattle float, which is these days is a large two-story uh, non-articulated vehicle, access their farm, uh, that is freely happening here already. Uh, so there's, there are, there's a, a history here of big vehicles using the highway here. And that brings me to the highway situation, really. There, there really isn't any, I mean, the, the highway officers have approved the situation, uh, and we all know, those of us who have been on planning some time know that if you go into an appeal, and the, and the authority on highway, which is in this case is the county council, have actually given uh, a traffic system the all clear, and so on, that you will not win against an inspector if the technical highways people have said what their what is being planned is uh, is uh, uh, sustainable in fact what we're dealing with here is 20 movements a day of hgvs and this is against 120 admitted in an afternoon for the wedding uh, venue we're told a thousand uh, persons will attend conference from time to time at the conference centre, which incidentally is further away than the 400 metres of the wedding centre. Uh, and we're told that all of that will all of that will happen. It's all uncontrolled anyway, and yet the concentration is on 20 movements a day on highways to do with this site. I mean, it's just not a reasonable comparison. Uh, I mean, if you just think about it, a thousand people at a conference, how many, if, you, if you're going to a conference with a thousand other people out in the wilds, how many other, how many cars and other vehicles is that going to entail? Probably slightly less than one person per car, but you may be talking about, well, somewhere between 600 and 800, I would imagine. Uh, and all of that is uncontrolled. And the Waverley Council, who have um, made a bit of a fuss about this also, they, they have given planning permission for this conference centre and for the wedding centre. Uh, and I'm not against them giving planning permission. Fine, that, that's fine. Uh, we want uh, business in rural areas. But they haven't put any traffic conditions on those planning conditions, on those planning permissions. And yet a, a big fuss is being made because we are putting a condition on 20 per day and there will be conditions of time the conditions of light, lights, bank, banksmen, and so on. And then we come also to uh, 
rather unspecific biodiversity or ecology objections. There's nothing substantiated. In any case, I think most of us know that um, things like water purity, water control, control of purity, this kind of thing, leakage from the site, uh, uh, protection of um, wildlife and so on, these things are more often than not in the control of third government agencies, not ourselves, but other government agencies. They are controlled, is the point. So if there is a problem, uh, they will be dealt with. And there's some mention of the travellers' site, but I see no evidence of how the travellers are going to be disadvantaged by this particular application. Yes, it's something in their environment, like everything else, whether it's a bus stop or a railway station that's in most of our environments, but it's, it's, it's not actually a, a critical situation that's really going to damage the lives of those people who are living there in that way. And then finally, uh, I'd just like to refer to the letter I've had from the portfolio holder of the Waverley Borough Council for this particular area. He writes uh, with all of the kind of objections um, or difficulties which I have just outlined. Um, uh, but in fact, it, the heading on the notice paper is headed Waverley Borough Council, and I think the somewhat dishonest, as far as I'm concerned, implication is that Waverley Borough Council are sending me a letter uh, outlining all of their concerns, when in fact these are the concerns of the individual councillor, the portfolio holder, as he happens to be also, but they are not the formal concerns of the Waverley Borough Council. The council may have some similar concerns, but if they have, they haven't uh, sent them on to me. Uh, so, as far as I'm concerned, the, the overall situation we've been listening to and considering on this so far this morning, which is in this huge pile of papers which we've all been sent, it's very, very difficult to pull out of this. I think, as Councillor uh, Council said right at the beginning, we have she was not hearing planning arguments, and frankly, I haven't been hearing planning arguments. What if, we, if this, those people who think that there are all of these really big problems with this site, they have to produce some real planning reasons why, if they're going to continue to pursue uh, what, the, what the way they've been speaking, which would result in a refusal. If they're going to pursue this, we have to have some proper planning reasons. If we don't have proper planning reasons, this council will be involved in tremendous costs in the first case to go to an appeal. And the chances are that if we're, not, if we're on unsure ground, uh, we could have huge costs given against us. I know some councillors, when I've mentioned this before, have said, oh, that's not a, not a problem. But I can tell you, certainly in my, my time on on Elmbridge Borough Council planning. This has caused the council a great deal of difficulty when on relatively minor, what looks like minor applications, they're refused for no good reason. We've had 50,000 pounds of time and we're not dealing with that sort of low level, relatively modest level, if you like put it that way, on this particular application. We could deal with something fairly horrendous. But in any case, never mind what the costs might be, if we aren't going to refuse this, we need some proper planning reasons. There can't be assumptions, there can't be premises that somehow we know that a major business will close. In any case, I'm not sure at all in my mind on planning whether you could actually put down as a planning reason um, a major effect on any other business. As I mentioned, we come back to the supermarket. I've never known a supermarket to be refused on protection of the high street. And quite clearly, every supermarket is put in pretty well destroys the high street. So uh, anyway, that's my view. I, I think it's very, very difficult to find proper planning reasons to refuse this, and uh, I will certainly be voting in favour. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Povey. Uh, Chairman, I am uh, most concerned I just heard the previous speaker offer us a thousand pounds to vote for the motion. I think he needs yeah. to be asked to leave the meeting. That, that, that wasn't quite what he said. 
No, it wasn't what I said. That wasn't but quite what he said. To be sure, I offered that I'd willing to take a thousand pound bet that the wedding venue wouldn't close if this application actually was permitted and the oil well was actually built. Bernie? Um, I think I've, I've got a couple of observations before my question. One was um, Councillor Mallett's comment about the Waverley Borough Council um, and that uh, he got this letter from the portfolio, but he hadn't got the um, uh, uh, comments uh, specifically from Waverley Borough Council. Well, actually, the papers that we've got are absolutely stock full of the comments from Waverley Borough Council. So I'm not sure what the relevance is of his statement. And um, they have, you know, very uh, profound concerns, for instance, upon their housing strategy. I can't remember what page it's on, but I think it's very early on in the documentation. Possibly, actually, let me just remember, maybe page 16. Uh, yes, about uh, uh, Waverley Borough Council's um, uh, uh, housing delivery policy. Um, and um, they believe that it's in conflict with the NPF paragraphs 59 to 70. Nine, and that's just one example of Waverley's um, comments as threaded through this document. Um, so actually, while I'm there, that was going to be one of my comments, actually um, uh, uh, referencing that exact point. Uh, also, he, uh, Councillor Mallet raises the issue of the travellers, um, uh, gypsies and Romani community. Um, now, my concern here is who actually came up with the um, assessment and the um, the elements of that assessment of the impact, because I my my understanding is that that was um, came was come was um, uh, delivered from the applicants. Uh, was it applicants' own research, or did they have an independent body looking into the research um, of the impact on that that community? And was the traveller community actually shown those findings and were able to comment on those findings? Because my understanding is they were not. And if they and, and if that eventually, I think late in the day, they might have caught sight of this, but not as it's not as part of the process, which is quite concerning. Um, now, going on to my. Oh, yes. Another reference to Councillor Mallet's comments. He talks, uh, mentioned several times about planning permission for supermarkets um, as an example of why we shouldn't regard the, ma uh, the impact of a major, a major significant rural employer and um, contributor to the economy. And I would say there is a, a difference. I mean, I actually think it's actually tragic that supermarkets have impacted the high street and other businesses, but they are creating alternative local employment, albeit less. That it, it, it's, 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 it's not, a, in my view, a great trade off, but it isn't taking away employment and significance. And when you list, hear that list of, um, of, of, of venue suppliers um, that... Can you get to your question? Uh, so anyway, I'll get to my question then. Um, one of the one of the witnesses um, mentioned that there were examples um, of where um, UCOG at Horse Hill had not complied with the transport management plan. Is is this true? Uh, are are there uh, significant examples of, of them not complying, um, or any examples indeed of them not in any of their units in Surrey? complying with transport management plans, because if that's the case, I think that's very, very significant um, to our deliberations. Um, and the one other point is about um, the HDB signage. Um, I want to come back to that. I didn't comment on that at the time. Um, so my understanding from the uh, officer's reply was that, yes, the signage did mean the roads was un were unsuitable for HGVs, but that sat navs were responsible for uh, taking this traffic down there. So I don't see that just because one, one error should be compounded with another. So if sat navs are driving 
um, literally driving lorries over a stretch of road that is deemed unsuitable for HGVs, that doesn't necessarily point to, to me as a, a reason why we should point more and locally driven, locally sourced HGVs onto that stretch of road. I, I can't see you can have you can't have it both ways. And, and all that I would suggest is that they report to the HDB companies that their, 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 their routing is co incorrect and not be adding more traffic to it. So I'd like, those are my two comments. Thank Question. you. Perry, did you want to, Questions, thank you. Andrew, did you want to say something at this point? Yeah, just because Bernie picked up the point about the HGVs, um, I, my understanding is that um, where the road uh, leaves uh, the A281, and which is where it says unsuitable for HGVs, uh, HGVs are not allowed to access Dunsfold Park by that route, uh, specifically because it's deemed to be uh, too dangerous. So again, that adds to the weight of evidence uh, in terms of the suitability uh, of this road. Uh, and the other point, again, because Mr. Mallet made it, amongst his other peculiar comments was that the um, the uh, housing at uh, Dunsfold, of course, is being given garden village status uh, and is going to, you know, is, is reckoned to be an exemplar for, uh, you know, doing all the best for climate change and uh, avoiding carbon emissions. So, again, it, it just seems to be uh, that that is the, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, essence of, of that development. Thank you. Right. Um, Paddy Stokes, do you want to start the batting on the answers for these? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, just on those two points regarding the HGV signage, um, I think the, the, the pertinent point is that the, the, coming back to the comment I made previously, in that whilst there are obviously signs there that, that state the, the that Dunsfold Road is unsuitable for HGVs. Um, we, we are certainly of the view that the section from the A281 going down to the application site um, isn't unsuitable. You know, as I said before, it's, it's of adequate width. Um, there's no evidence of vehicles overrunning verges. There's clearly a great number of HGVs that use that road uh, every, every week. Um, and none of that has caused uh, any obvious problems. Uh, so, so my understanding is that those signs have been corrected, uh, been erected to stop the through routing of traffic all the way through to to Milford and Godalming, rather than obviously just that that section from from the A two eight one down towards the application site. Um, and then in regard to Dunsfold Park, um, I'm afraid I've not been involved in the, the the detail of the Dunsfold development, so I can't comment specifically on on what is and what isn't permitted in terms of HGV access there. But my only assumption would be, and this is, is and, and I have to make it clear, this is only an assumption, is that there would be a preference for HGV traffic to use the the new site access that will be built into Dunsfold um, as a preference, as, as as because that would be the um, the principal point at which vehicles will be able to access directly onto the the, the A two eight one. But but that's from my very limited understanding of, of the Dunsfold development. That the, and like I said, it is only assumptions. David? Yeah, um, how the new settlement at Dunsfold Park will be accessed is addressed in the officer report. Um, I haven't got the reference in front of me. Um, but uh, what I do know is that um, when Dunsfold Park is, is, is the, actual, the new settlement, um, the access from Stovall's Hill will, will, not, will not be available. Um, I think, I think all vehicles will come out straight onto the A281, where the, where the new junction is, either has been or is being created uh, with, with the new roundabout. And um, I think there's a, I think there's a small, um, might be access, access somewhere at the bottom of High Luxury Road for um, users of the public driveway. So, so walkers might be able to get in and out, but no, no vehicle traffic. Um, so I, th I, th I think I think it's safe to assume that the main access will be directly out onto the a onto the A281. Um, so I mean, if, if, there's, a, if there's an impact, if someone's, someone's wants to apply, there might be a cumulative traffic impact between the um, Dunstable Park and the Wellside application. Um, I think it'd be a diff very difficult argument to substantiate, given given the numbers we're talking about. 
Um, <coughs> impact of housing on Dunsfell Park. Um, I think it's addressed very clearly, isn't it, in, 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 the, um, well, well, in, the, in the final update sheet. I mean, apologies, it was only circulated yesterday, but um, we, 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 do, we do accept representations up until, up until 12 noon on the day day towards the committee, and um, they need to be considered and addressed, so that, that's really the reason why it get, goes out quite late. Um, Could you actually say what it said might help? In the report. The, uh, the update. What was the key fact? So, final paragraph on the update sheet says officers can, can, can confirm that all of the previous responses received from the borough council have been considered and addressed in the officer report and planning and regulatory committee on 29th of June 2020 attached at Annex 1. The impact of the application on Dunsfield Park that are considered relevant to planning have been considered and addressed in paragraphs 230, 378, 403, 404, 458, 642, 646, and, seven, and 672 to 680 of Annex 1. So that's the Office, Officer Report to Planning and Regul Regulatory Committee on the 29th of June. Then goes on to say the integrity of the well beneath the surface is not a matter for the Mineral Planning Authority to resolve as part of the, de the determination of the application. This falls within the remit of other regulators, uh, particularly the Oil and Gas Authority and the Health and Safety Executive, whose roles, together with that of the Environment Agency, are explained in paragraphs 128 to 147 of Annex 1. Um, that, I mean, I, that's, I think that, that, that's fine, that seems to be the answer. So it's already, it's already included, that's what you always say. Right. Um, there's a point I should have answered earlier, I just approve that. Briefly from uh, Councillor Evans about um, winter screening. Um, how the, the, the images of the trees um, were taken in springtime, and it, it doesn't take account of the true effect or impact of the development in terms of the visual impact in the winter time when the trees lose their leaves. And that, that, that was dealt with um, some time ago during the consideration of the application, and the applicant was asked to um, submit some more, some, some further information. They did, and they they. they what they did is they superimposed images of the well site, so that she's just, just, just to give an idea of what, what the impact would be um, in the winter time. Uh, the county landscape consultant um, took that on board, and um, his response is, is as recorded in the officer report, and we had no objection on, on landscape grounds. Horse Hill lack of compliance with the TMP, um, not something I'm aware of. Um, it sounds like an enforcement issue um, without knowing any, any details of what, of, of, what, of what the breach was. Um, you know, there's, there's no reason there. There's no reason there that we could use. To, I, I don't think um, to um, um, scupper the merits of this planning application for us today. Um, 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 it, 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 we, we, we need more information, um, but um, as, as I say, as I said in my introduction, each, each planning application has to be considered on its merits. Right. Right. Um, I believe, Penny Rivers, you want to move a, a motion at this point, is that right? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes. And um, I'm not as experienced as Councillor Mallet, but I think that policies... MC1, MC14 and MC15 cover really what I feel, and it is about the significant adverse impacts arising from this development. I haven't heard anything today that, that really um, has shown me that there won't be adverse impacts caused by this development. And um, so that is why I would propose refusal based on this development being in conflict with policies MC1, MC14 and MC15. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a second? Chairman, yes, uh, I'm willing to second. Very good. Right. Uh, Stephen Jenkins wants to sort of put some points in at this moment, so you call Stephen next and then ask Andrew if you want to, want to speak. 
motion. Right. Stephen? Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to just to focus members' uh, minds really on um, what the relevant development plan is, the policies and national policy. And we've heard many arguments about uh, the concerns. Um, and as a reminder, it's a, a development which is temporary for three years um, for the expiration and appraisal. Uh, it will involve a drilling rig, which is obviously causing some concern, but that that is there for a limited period, and we've been told it's weeks in order to drill the several wells. Um, I know for a fact, because I've been here for over 20 years, we've had many exploration permissions uh, in Surrey, and some of them going on to production. And as um, Councillor um, Taylor has uh, alluded to, Albury is one of them. Uh, Hookwood we have, Brook Brockham, Bletchenley, Oxted. These are all in rural locations uh, and similar to Loxley. And there's been no significant adverse impact on the environment or businesses from these developments. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that the oil and gas industry is one of the most regulated industries in the UK. We have the Oil and Gas Authority granting licenses and the monitoring of the working programs for these sites. We have the health and safety exec overseeing safety of the operations. And um, we have the environment agency responsible for environmental regulation and pollution control, which is a concern being raised. And then we have the county plan authority, um, which then ensures control of the use of the land. And we we do that through conditions and monitoring, as we've done with the existing sites. So in respect to this application, none of these regulatory regime or regulators um, are objecting to this because they consider it acceptable. And we've had no technical objections from the, the consultees in respect of highways, noise, lighting, air quality and landscape. So it's clear from officers' viewpoint that there, there is no significant impact from this development based on that, on those technical advisors assessing what the applicant submitted. Um, I, I mentioned that a loss of view is not a material consideration, if they're thinking along those lines. But I just reiterate what um, the, the MPF says. It's essential that there's a, a sufficient supply of minerals to provide the infrastructure, the buildings, the energy, and the goods that the country needs. And this is what the MPF and national policy states. And then it says, when determining applications, great weight should be given to the benefits of mineral extraction. And this is mineral extraction and including the benefits of the economy. So I thought I'd just sum that up um, for members to think on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrew, just a second, would you like to speak now or later? Yeah, uh, Chairman, I think uh, I want to endorse what the proposer said about the uh, impact on uh, local businesses, although the officers just compared to other sites. I'm not aware that any of the other sites are next to a weddings events business, which I think is uh, completely different and one that relies on uh, the particular situation that it's in. And so clearly, I was very struck by the uh, by the, the two speakers on, from the local businesses as to, you know, the passion they have for their businesses uh, and the concerns that they have uh, for them going forward. Um, I, I still uh, I don't accept that um, just, you know, because some of the technical officers have a view on highways. Uh, I believe as local members, we have a view because we hear it from residents all the time. Uh, and we hear it from our communities all the time. Uh, and, and I do believe there's an objection, a uh, perfectly valid objection in terms of highways. Uh, and I think the, the third one would be around uh, the landscape. Uh, we have this designation of the ALGV, uh, and, and I think it has a meaning, and I think it's one that's uh, loved by the people of Surrey, and I think even though the specific tower might only be there for a more limited time, uh, clearly the site will be viewable from uh, from the hill uh, and imposed on that uh, landscape. And I think, again, that's another valid reason in planning terms uh, for voting against. Thank you. 
It's been pointed out to me we haven't got specific wording for the motion as such. We probably should break to try and sort that out, shouldn't we? Yeah, and also to put the summary together. Put the summary together. So we will. How long do you want? 20 minutes, quarter to two? Yes, so we'll break till course two, just, and then we'll come back to the, to the vote motion. Established in national planning and energy policy. I appreciate members were concerned about lack of evidence of volumes, etc. Impact on local businesses. Members clearly very concerned that uh, could have an adverse effect on other local businesses. Climate change in latest government policy. Does it comply? The impact of developments on the landscape in the AGLV, AGLV joining to the AONV. Some impact, I have no objection from the statutory consultees. It's weighed this against the benefits of development. Traffic network being suitable or not suitable, with highway improvements, County Highway Authority says it is suitable. Members point out existing sites for other hydrocarbon developments in the county all coexist with businesses and landscape in other parts of the county. The question was whether the development is in conflict with policies MC1, MC14, MC15, significant adverse effects, like businesses, highways and landscape. That, that's the issue we've, raised, we've heavily gone through. Um, Nancy is going to also give you a quick update on some grounds for refusal and what, how it all fits together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> um, Members, I was just going to um, remind you um, that while um, costs, the costs consequences of a likely decision are not a material planning consideration, um, members need to bear in mind that um, the, um, the, of the importance of having reasons for refusal that stand up to scrutiny on the planning merits, uh, supported by robust evidence. And that, that's the case law position in relation to this. Um, so uh, those are the reasons for refusal that one will be looking for, stand, that stand up to scrutiny on the planning merits, supported by robust evidence. So, uh, members have raised concerns in respect of three policies that they say the proposal does not comply with. Um, officers don't consider that policy MC1 is relevant in this case. It's simply the spatial strategy for the location of mineral development in the county. And in respect of oil and gas development, it simply says it would be concentrated in the southern half of the county, which I think actually this would comply with. In respect of the other two policies referred to, I will read out the policies so members are aware of what they say. Policy MC14, reducing the adverse impacts of mineral development. Mineral development will be permitted only where a need has been demonstrated and the applicant has provided information sufficient for the Mineral Planning Authority to be satisfied that there would be no significant adverse impacts arising from the development. Proposals for development within preferred areas will be expected to address the key development requirements set out for each. In determining planning applications for mineral development, potential impacts related to the following issues where relevant will be considered, giving particular attention to those highlighted in any screening opinion made for the site. And in respect of the issues that were raised, the relevant Subsection is subsection three, 
the appearance, quality and character of the landscape and any features that can contribute to its distinctiveness. In respect of policy MC15, transport for minerals, applications for mineral development should include a transport assessment of potential impacts on highway safety, congestion and demand management. The assessment should also explore how the movement of minerals within and outside the site will address issues of emissions control, energy efficiency and amenity. Applicants will be expected to address alternatives to road-based methods of transport, especially where these can use existing railway sidings. Mineral development involving transportation pipe by road will be permitted only where there is no practicable alternative to the use of road-based transport that would have a lower impact on communities and the environment. The highway network is of an appropriate standard for use by the traffic generated by the development or can be suitably improved. And arrangements for site access and the traffic generated by the development would not have any significant adverse impacts on highway safety, air quality, residential amenity, the environment or the effective operation of the highway network. In respect of the issues put forward by members, I will reiterate that officers are very strongly of the view that the policy, the development complies with the policy and therefore should not be refused. However, on the basis of the information that members have supplied, we are suggesting possible reasons for refusal on the following grounds. It has not been demonstrated that the highway network is of an appropriate standard for use by the traffic generated by the development, or that arrangements for the tra sorry, or that the traffic generated by the development would not have a significant adverse impact on highway safety, contrary to Surrey Minerals Plan Core Strategy Policy MC15. And then in respect of landscape, it has not been demonstrated that the applicant has provided information sufficient for the Mineral Planning Authority to be satisfied that there would be no significant adverse impact on the appearance, quality and character of the landscape and any features that contribute towards its distinctiveness, including its designation as an area of great landscape value. Contrary to Surrey Minerals Plan and Core Strategy Policy MC14, subsection 3. Right. To those who put the motion up, are you supportive of that? Thank you, yes. Thank yes, you. I'm happy with that. Yes, thank you, Jim. So, does anybody else want to speak on this, or do we just put this to the vote? Could we? Right. Can I, ask, can I just ask, what happens next to those proposals if voted through? What's the next? If if one is still concerned about the economic impact, etc., does that get forever put aside at this stage? Yeah. Well, it, 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 it it's it's to one side because there is no planning reason, a separate planning reason to go with it. So legally, it wouldn't stand up. Which is the point. You wouldn't have robust evidence to do that, which is the problem. Yeah. And planning policy to go with it, which is the challenge. Um, right. If we go to a vote, Joss, could you read out the members? And Thanks, Chairman. Please close. And before. Joss has disappeared. Thank you, Chairman. So, could 
Members, please state clearly for, against, or abstain to the motion just read by Caroline. Um, and before stating your vote, please also de- declare that you have been present and have heard the full debate. Stephen Cooksey. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I'm, uh, I have been present throughout the whole of the meeting, and I am in favour of the motion to refuse the mission. Thank you. Tim Evans. Uh, thank you, Chairman Josh. Uh, I've been present throughout the entire meeting, and I too am in favour of the motion to refuse. Tim Hall. Uh, I've been present throughout, and I vote against the motion. I have been present for the whole meeting and I am for the motion. Dennis Mallet. I have been present for the whole meeting and I am against the motion. Bernie Mayer. I've been present for the whole meeting, heard the full deba- uh, debate, and I am for the motion. So what you saying? I've been present for the whole meeting, and I vote against the motion. Andrew Covey. I've been present for the whole debate, and I vote for the motion. Penny Rivers. Thank you. I've been present for the whole debate and I, my vote is to refuse. For the motion. For the motion. Keith Taylor. For the motion. Keith Taylor, please. Uh, yes, I'm present throughout the debate and I'm against the motion. And Rose Thorn. I have been present throughout and I'm against the motion. Right, therefore declare the motion is passed six votes to five. Therefore, we move on to item eight, the Surrey County Council's local list, request for formal adoption of the local list, and I suspect I call on Jessica Darvo at this moment. Thank you, Chairman. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Right. Please, Jessica, if you'd like to say anything. It's just a report. Uh, good afternoon. Today I'm presenting to you Surrey County Council's local list for adoption. Article 11 of the Town and Country Planning Development Management Procedure, England Order 2015, requires local planning authorities to produce a local list of information, also known as a validation checklist. This is essentially a list of the information required to accompany a particular planning application. The purpose of the local list is to provide guidance to applicants and agents on validation requirements of planning applications submitted to the County Planning Authority. It ensures consistency in registering and validating applications and improves efficiencies in the determination process. 
There is a requirement by the National Planning Policy Guidance that local planning authorities review and amend their local lists every two years, ensuring all guidance is up to date. The last review of the County Planning Authority's local list was undertaken in September 2017. Therefore, it is timely to review the current local list. The process for undertaking the review of the local list includes reviewing the details in the existing local list, consulting on proposed changes, reviewing and incorporating relevant comments and or changes received following the consultation, and then finalising the revised local list. A consultation exercise on the proposed local list review took place between the 11th of August and the 6th of October 2020 and was undertaken via the Surrey Says Consultation Hub Online. Both internal and external statutory and non-statutory consultees were invited to comment as part of this consultation exercise. In total, 11 comments were received from individuals and organisations alongside planning officer comments, and those were reflected in the revised documents and are outlined in the schedule of modification documents attached to this agenda and the officer report. The comments in the main relate to the consistency of the links to references and guidance documents and some inaccuracies to the text which have now been corrected. The schedule of modifications shows the detailed comments of those who have responded to the consultation and also the actions taken by officers in response to those comments. The other main change to the local list is the formatting of the document which has been revised in accordance with the public sector bodies, website and mobile applications, number two, accessibility regulations 2018. As such, now following the expiry of the consultation period and the amendments made, officers request that, planning, that the planning regulatory committee adopt Surrey County Council's local list for validation of planning applications November 2020. Thank you, and I welcome any questions. All right, don't see any questions, so can I move the adoption of this? Is that agreed? Oh, Bernie. You're mute still. I've just got two questions. You'll be relieved to hear. Um, one is about uh, I don't see a list and it's maybe my fault because there was a lot of papers, a list of who you consulted and how you approached them and how you advertised the consultation. Um, because I noticed there was a quite a small response. Um, so uh, I'm just wanting to know that. And the other thing is on tape, and actually this is pertinent to what the discussions today really, um, page 248249, uh, not at the number 19. It seems to me that one of the issues clearly that's where there's a gaping hole is where something uh, landscaping has a material impact on the nature of a business or I mean it could be you know you have beautiful landscape gardens or something or or um, but in this case it's the grounds and the scenery are part of a business's USP and a pricing policy that they have that. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that in the wording or anywhere that is a part of a validation that should be taken into account and where the active pursuance of that business should should take place to truly understand the impacts um, of financial, economic and employment impacts of a landscaping in, uh, change. Um, now, I get to the point, therefore, that does the change in page 259, where it says the assessment should help determine whether further detailed or mitigation measures in the form of landscape scheme or other compensations are required? Somewhere there, can the wording take into account that what I've just suggested should be part of the considerations and part of the validation? Bernie, can we just ask you to clarify which page or paragraph you write? Page 259. 
It's page 248 and 249. Um, it's, it says um, point 19, this text should be removed. And then on page 259, uh, point 19, this uh, text should be added. Uh, it doesn't actually go uh, as go to the point that I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is that the point I'm suggesting needs to go into there somewhere into the wording, because obviously there's a gaping hole. And it's something that it, we, if we're serious about the economy, local economy and you know local businesses and all the things that have come out in our latest five point plan and indeed many boroughs plans for um, then we need we need to have that aspect of landscaping as part of impact of landscaping, the financial employment impact that uh, needs to be somewhere in the validation process. And I think obviously we need to clearly define that. But in in this specific specific instance, it's quite clear that the landscape is part of the USP and the value and the pricing of that business. And, you know, there are many, many businesses I was in. You know, I understand this business very, very well. And there are um, I don't mean the, the, the this particular high Billingshurst case, but, you know, events as a whole and location, location, location is a key aspect of being able to have a business that can one um, uh, do large events and thus employ large sections of the local community, which then involve B&Bs, pubs and restaurants and all sorts of other things. So we need that. Um, we need to understand the value of landscape to the impact of local economy. Um, you can't change anything. No, it have to be looked at. Yeah, we can consult on it. I'm going to do that. Landscape assessment is covered in quite some detail, so I'm not entirely sure. Guidelines for landscape and visual impact assessment are published by the Landscape Institute, so we would expect any landscape assessment to comply with that. But we can't we can't just amend this Well I can't find the precise wording that Catherine, um, you're talking about. Well, I think my page is much slightly different to everyone else's. But in respect of landscape assessment, um, landscape assessment is subject to, um, to best practice guidance, um, and we would expect them to, to meet that. Stephen, do you want to come in at this point? Yeah, um, I think um, Jessica will pick up the first question and the second one about this landscape. The validation checklist obviously has to follow what's in policy and what um, Mrs. Muir is, is trying to do is change policy here and, and dictate what needs to go in um, and what we have reference to. So um, I think if you want um, have to take uh, into account local economy and businesses, then you have to go back and, and change policy. And then we that validation checklist then will refer to that policy or guidance as uh, Caroline's been pointing to in terms of landscape guidance. Hmm. Uh, Tim Evans. Thank you. <laughs> I got myself muted again. I don't know how, but I two oh, five. Go for it. Two four two four nine is what we're talking about, not two five nine. Yes. 
Yes, that's what we're talking about. I wanted yeah. to clarify that for others because there seemed to be some confusion. That's that's so. I'll, now I'll mute myself again. Thank you. Um, I think we need to take this back, back as a policy thing. Um, it doesn't it's a question for the future, and I don't think this is probably the point to do this. I think mean, it's to go after under the policy, as Stephen says. We're about to commence work on the review of the minimum plan, so. Oh, right. So that's, that would, that's something that we can... We can add into that review, so that would make some sense. Mm-hmm. Right, we do that. Because I, I still don't understand what you mean. If it was a, if you produced a lake at the end of... Or if you took away somebody's lake, <laughs> by their business, you might, for instance, as one landscape, you could have... It would be quite a serious effect. I can see why there are certain places where it would have an effect, wouldn't it? If you produce a lake at the, the end of somebody's garden. That's really what I'm saying, that it's not to be applied everywhere, but that it, it needs to be where it is crucial. Then we need to have the ability to safeguard that. Yes, I see what you're saying. But, right, well, we'll put that back into the policy review, because the policy review is starting. We'll go from there. We'll put this, and this will obviously hold until then, for obvious reasons. We'll keep going. So, with that extra thing for the policy review to go forward with, can we agree... The uh, adoption of the present local list after its recent review. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much. Agreed. Bring the meeting to a close. Agreed. 1523. Can I thank everybody for their patience and uh, contributions? Thank you. Thank you.